thank you for the invitation. It's a pity I could not be in person there, but uh, soon I think the meetings will be all in person. And, um, and I'm sorry I could not attend all the, all the sessions because of the time zone difference. I'm in Brazil, so it's exactly 12 hour time zone lapse. As I was saying, if I move left or right, I think I get closer to Korean time zone. Anyway, so I'm going to talk a bit about the CMB DIPO. I realized this was already uh, covered in some of the talks of this conference. So I'll go quickly on some of the subjects which was already covered. And um, let me know in the questions if, you, if you, any gap was left. So um, let's talk about the CMB DIPO, right? So, uh, you know, after Planck, you know, we are already cosmic variance limited in all temperature modes, all the way to multiple of 1,700 now. Uh, good measurements of the E mode polarization up to 1200, you know, not really cosmic variance limited, but good measurements. And, you know, ACT, SPT get to even higher multiples and, uh, you know, future uh, iterations of these instruments, Simon's Observatory and other instruments on the ground will cover even higher modes, you know, although the, the fraction of the sky cover is smaller. But there's one multiple which is still missing from our you know, book of, of multiples measured, which is the first one, you know, which is the, if, if you neglect the monopole, it's the dipole, L equal one. And of course, all the temperature maps that you see usually in this, uh, of the CMB has the dipole removed, otherwise you would see this, this figure, not those nice patterns of cold and hot spots. Um, is that okay. So, uh, if we assume there is no intrinsic dipole, no dipole really at the last scattering surface, this is a direct measurement of the velocity of the sun with respect to the CMB. And if you go into this assumption, you get a velocity around 370 kilometers per second, which is basically this nice number of 1.234 times 10 to the minus 3. And in Planck 2015, it was even better. It was 1.2345, which could be one of the new CMB anomalies if you want. But now, you know, the, the measurements change, so let's just say 1.234. So, um, and the direction is also very well measured, but there might be, of course, all the contributions to the dipole. There could be some, uh, something in the less scattering surface going on. So it could be some isocurvature or adiabatic gravitational potential, some non-Gaussian gravitational potential. It could be dipolar lensing, you know, lensing due to the structure, there's a dipolar component to the weak lensing. It could be gradients of super horizon modes and other things have been suggested in the literature. And the, the question is how to tell these contributions apart. So as uh, Smoot said in his talk, you know, there's this nice uh, little thing, which is if you have a movement, if you have some kinematic going on, you also have aberration, not only Doppler, but aberration. And aberration changes the incoming direction of, 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 every, you know, of the photons. So uh, the example is if you, there's rain and there's no wind, in you stop in the red light, you see the rain falling perpendicular, but as soon as you have some velocity in your car, you see the raindrops falling in the direction from, it seems that like they are falling from in front of you hitting your windshield. And this also happens to the CMB satellites or any instrument even on earth, which is moving you know, uh, with the earth or around the sun or the Lagrange point, doesn't matter. It's, it's moving with respect to the CMB, so it picks some aberration. So here I have a simulated Gaussian map of the CMB with no uh, peculiar velocity, beta equals zero. And now I'm gonna put a 10% speed of light velocity and then you get this map. So if I move back and forth from these maps, you can see here, I think you can see my, my mouse cursor here. You can see around this direction, around the mouse cursor, there's a convergence of hot and cold spots and in the antipolar direction, there's a divergence of hot and cold spots. Okay, and this is exactly the aberration measurement. If I put 50% of the speed of light to get something which is, you know, directly observed by eye, you know, you don't even have to go back and forth. Now, this is all fine and good, but the real beta is around 10 to minus three. So it's a very subtle effect that you need to build a careful estimator in order to detect. So you can, you can compute what happens to the multiples, the ALMs, when you have a boost. And this will, I have this ALM X because this will, will, will be in effect for temperature aberration, Sorry, for temperature or uh, polarization in moles, B moles, or T. And you have basically a kernel that couples, you know, your primordial ALMs, so you get, you know, the final boosted ALMs. Now, the most important correlation is the L plus one, which is other beta. And you can basically, you know, summarize this equation to good approximation, at least for you know, the multiples covered by Planck, by this ALM boost is the primordial ALM plus some coefficients which we call C minus and C plus in this paper, which is over 10 years ago now, 
uh, which couples then the primordial LM L minus one and L plus one. Okay, and I have these coefficients here. Don't worry too much about the equations. I will try to avoid many equations here. But the point is, there's some some of these coefficients are due to the aberration effect, which is the change of angles of arrival of the photons. And some of these coefficients are what we call Doppler modulations because they are just coming from the shift of frequency. It's a cross term of the shift of frequency that happens on 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 your, uh, on your maps on the high um, of multiples. So this. So the Doppler effect goes beyond just L equal one. Okay, there's these couplings here that happens just due to the frequency shift. In any case, you have these coefficients or the beta, okay, plus some terms here, which are some God integral terms, you know. Uh, and then you have these two effects, okay? So if A equals one is you have aberration, D equal one Doppler, in general, if you have a, a velocity, you have both, okay? But you can play, you know, in, in theory, you can play by just putting one of them if you want. Now, these predictor, this predictor correlations, they have some interesting things because they have some properties. First of all, they do not affect uh, the, the primordial angular power spectrum because actually they do affect, but it's all the beta squared. And uh, unless you have a mass, then it's not really beta squared, but it's very small in practice. But they do break the statistical isotropy of the CMB. So you don't have any more, you know, this uh, diagonal correlation here completely. You have off diagonal correlations, as I was saying. So you can build an estimator for this velocity beta. And since all multiples are affected, this means that the more modes you measure, the more multiples you measure, the better your signal to noise. And this affects the E, T, and B maps. So if you measure E, E, T, T, E, T, all the combinations you want, you get more signal to noise, in generally speaking, OK? Now, of course, as I said, Planck 2018, they already cover lots of these multiples. So you get good signal to noise, and this is basically almost simultaneously proposed by uh, no, uh, myself, myself and colleagues, and colleagues. And Kozowski and uh, Kanishvili, and uh, well, this is over 10 years ago. So we did in 2011 some forecast, detailed forecast for different experiments, uh, what, what would be the signal to noise of these uh, couplings. And you get the signal to noise for W map was less than one, so you get the, you know, it's in red, you cannot see it. For Planck, we estimated it to be above five. So we were very excited that it could be seen by Planck. And it could, in principle, also be seen from the ground if you have a larger fraction of sky. So if you have ACT and SPT covering, uh, so especially if you know, cover more F, F sky, you could get to signal to noise, in principle, even higher than Planck. Okay? We also revised this for the core satellite, which was proposed a few years ago to ESA, and it got a signal to noise of around 13. If you have an ideal experiment all the way to a multiple of 3,000, you can get up to 20, okay, and even more. And then a couple of years later, the Planck put this uh, nice Epusimov paper out, which they uh, measure these correlations, and they have these very often cited results of 384 plus minus 78. But they do have lots of systematic noise, even larger than statistical uh, noise. So it's uh, less than, you know, overall around three sigma ish, uh, less than three sigma actually measurement of, of this. Uh, Couplings. Yeah. Now there's a caveat, and I have to. I'm going to discuss uh, sometimes during my talk. There's an important subtlety to these um, kind of measurements, and the point is that the CMB experiments they do not measure temperature; they do they measure intensity, or if you prefer, in case of Planck, intensity differences. Okay. So, so basically, since W map and, and CMB, or even before, you now temperature has been defined as, uh, through a linear or linearized black body spectrum relation. So this definition we refer to as linearized temperature. And uh, this was first pointed out by this Epusimov paper. And this introduces spurious second order effect in CMB, which are not primordial. They just the fact that you're converting intensity to temperature, not using an exact formula, just a, a linearized first order formula. And because of this, you know, basically all your measurements of this uh, intensity so we have here the black body you know for uh, intensity uh, spectrum and the, the you can perturb it to call this you know, compute these perturbations in intensity and this related to delta t but again this is a linear relation you're, you're stuck in linear relation so basically all the the, the measurements you have of, of these intensity differences they pick up delta t over t which is what you want but they also pick up delta t over t squared time times a frequency dependent factor which you know it's a cotangent hyperbolic cotangent of the frequency, but it's basically one for low frequencies, and then it it, it goes uh, higher and higher for higher frequencies. 
Now, this delta t over t, if you if talking normal primordial fluctuations, they are 10 to minus 5. So this will be 10 to minus 10, and it should be fine. But if you have a larger primordial fluctuation, then you, you, you start getting confounding factors because of this. So there's pure second order effects that comes just from this definition of temperature, which is there in all Planck maps. It affects the measurements of the quadrupole, first of all, because the quadrupole has a Doppler quadrupole term, which is all the beta squared. Now, now if beta is 10 to minus 3, beta squared is 10 to minus 6, which is already of the order of a quadrupole perturbation, 10 to minus 5. So it's a 10%-ish contribution. Right. And uh, it can lead also to, to uh, some calibration uh, degradation, which is small for Planck, but you can improve the, the, the calibration because, in effect, there's some coupling of the orbital dipole, which is usually trivially removed. There's a 10 to minus 4 dipole due to the movement of the sun around so the Earth around the sun. It's nothing to do with the movement of the sun respect to the CMB. So, but there's a cup and there's a term which is beta solar times beta orbital. And then again, you have every, every time you have a square term, you can get these uh, spurious contributions. It also introduces something we call the dipole distortion, which are, you know, again was first uh, shown in the Pussy Morphy paper. And the Doppler like couplings, which are proportional to the dipole, but they are independent. That's the crucial point of the physical origin of the dipole. Whatever observe, observation we make of the dipole, doesn't matter if it is primordial, if it's kinematic. Whatever is there is going to leak up into the uh, into higher multiples with these coupling modes. Okay, and this is very important because it contains no new information apart from the dipole. It's just you're looking at parts of the dipole elsewhere. So this uh, dipole distortion they produce then Doppler couplings, L plus one couplings, which enhance the significance of the Doppler effect. In the Planck Pusimov, this was called the boost factor which is around for Doppler 1.5 depends on which map you use which frequencies you now each 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 uh, component separation uh, technique of Planck has different combinations of frequencies so they have different weights so you have an overall average weight which changes so it's 1.5 this is extra so it means that your Doppler couplings is going to be 2.5 what it would be without this because it's one which is real and 1.5 which is coming from this uh, spurious term and, but there, again, there's no new information, right? And if you do not remove this from the data, this means your, your Doppler measurements, your Doppler couplings will be uh, uh, shifted towards the dipole direction because part of it will be just a dipole. So in the Pussy paper, this was not removed. So the values are not really independent from the dipole. There's some you know, correlations of those measurements and the dipole. And that's what we showed uh, with Alessio Notari here uh, some years ago. And in, in this also appears in the uh, thermal Sunyevsky Dobich data. There's, uh, you know, the, 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 this DD dipole distortion, they leak some Doppler signal into the TSD maps. In the TSD maps themselves, the significance is low, okay? But you can cross correlate the TSD maps and the temperature maps because now these things is, is cross correlated. So there's no cosmic variance there. So it, we did some estimation back in 2015 and said this could be measured. With, with Planck at high significance, maybe up to 10 sigma or so. But again, this will be just as a cross check that you're doing everything right in a data analysis. It's not bringing any new information that uh, from uh, no, from the primordial universe. And what happens is this, you have this Doppler quadrupole term here. You know, So you have a quadrupole and the regions where, where the quadrupole is high, you have this uh, correlation high with the thermal synapse of the effect. And in the region, which is blue, you have no correlation. So you can really build a, a a pipeline to detect this and actually Planck did this Planck collaboration did this last year and um, they detected this at around six sigma using two different pipelines one is a harmonics based pipeline as you suggest another one is a map based pipeline they kind of agreed to good precision and it's a six sigma cross check that you're doing things correctly in the cmb okay and also for future cmb experiments this will be higher than the instrumental noise so you do have to worry about if you want to measure TSC, you have to remove this thing. Now, what about the primordial CMB dipole? So can a measurement of this velocity and couplings you know, allow us to measure the primordial CMB dipole? Or could, be, could it be that the primordial dipole also produce some aberration Doppler-like signatures? So some couplings between L plus one. We were pondering this question for some time, you know, and the point is the primordial versus kinematic separation is not very straightforward because for instance, for the abatic perturbations, there's some degeneracy 
between what is the Doppler effect and what's the primordial perturbation. So to have a clear answer, you really need to do a careful second order perturbation analysis. And that's what uh, my student Omar Rodan and myself and Alessio Tai did some years ago. And we found that the Doppler couplings uh, were generated naturally in single fuse low row inflation, again, to the, at the, at the polar gravitational potential, just like a regular boost. But so, which means that if you do measure different couplings, Doppler couplings, the, then you would expect from the velocity, this means that, you know, you can rule out slow row inflation this way, okay? Now, aberration couplings are not uh, in general degenerate, unless you really fine tune your, you know, uh, primordial conditions, right? So you have to fine tune the radio profile of the gravitation potential, you know, to, to, uh, to have an induced dipolar lensing effect exactly like the aberration. And if the dipole is isocurvature, it's even worse because you have also to find to the distance from us to the less Catherine surface. So we, what, is, what this means is that combining the dipole measurements, the Doppler couplings and the aberration couplings, you can measure the peculiar velocity and the intrinsic CMB dipole. So this is a table summarizing results. You know, you can have different scenarios, peculiar velocity, some dipolar potential, which could be a diabatic of isocurvature non-Gaussian. And they all can produce easily a 10 to minus three dipole. You know, they can, some of them can produce 10 to minus eight Doppler-like couplings. Uh, although for, for this case, it's really, it's been shown only on the large scales. Uh, but aberration-like couplings, you don't expect them to be produced. You need fine tuning to have this, right? And if you have a non-Gaussian dipole potential, even the Doppler effect will be different. So it, you can do this. You can measure uh, uh, the primordial dipole. Now, the velocity is maybe 10 to 100 times larger than the expected primordial contribution which means you need to measure both with 10 to 100 sigma, ideally 100 sigma, okay? So you can get this 1% primordial effect if it is really there. So George Muth in his talk was assuming that you have, you know, a 10 to minus four primordial contribution. So then you just need 10 sigma. Now, uh, for the CMB, you need to go to a multiple of 10,000 really with good measurements to get this kind of level of, of, uh, of precision. So of course, it's very high L, you have very tiny signal, you have lots of silk damping, you have lots of foregrounds, it's really complicated. So it's really hard to go beyond, let's say, 20 sigma with the CMB. But there are many claims, as we have seen in this conference, of large scale anomalies. And we may still rule out some exotic primordial models by measuring the intrinsic dipole and putting some upper boundaries. Okay? Because again, if there's something going strange in the octopole, quadrupole, then the dipole is, of course, the next one you expect to see this, right? And even larger. So, uh, so, right, so you need to measure all three quantities independently to be able to better separate you know, the contributions. So we built three, we built a matrix that really cover all three components, the Cartesian components of aberration Doppler separately. You do need, to, of course, to account for mask and the anisotropic noise of, of the satellite, which is really relevant. Uh, and of course, both aberration Doppler, they are both L plus one coupling, so they are not independent. They correlate, the measurements are, you know, they always be correlated. Now, we did a brute force approach where we corrected the biases by performing over around 9,000 real hill peak simulations where we have a code introduces the, the, the aberration or Doppler couplings or a boost, which means both together. When we say a boost, I'm, I'm putting aberration Doppler in the same direction collinearly. And you have 300 simulations from noise and isotropic noise with, from the collaboration that we use for SMIC and NUC maps. And of course, you need to estimate these type of distortions precisely and they depend on the weight, the frequency weight. So you have to recover the weights using each pipeline. And we were able to do that for SMIC and NUC, which has you know, a pipeline which is sensible enough to recover these effects because they're not so involved. From command and self, it's very nonlinear, the effect. It's very hard to estimate, really, really tough to estimate what is this effect in the end in different multiples. So we did for SMIC and NUC, but it's fine because it already gives us two maps so we can test if your pipeline is working by confronting both, okay? So this is estimated for temperature and polarization. And it, it, it depends a bit on, on the multiple, right? We don't use a constant. And then we do lots of simulations to see if the pipeline is working, which means that you put a signal in the simulation, then put all the problems, the mass, the noise, the lensing, and try to recover, and try to see if we recover what we input. So here we have a map basically showing, you know, how much in absolute value we recover, from what we input. So we recover up to plus minus 5%-ish in general. And these arrows show the direction you recover, the estimation recovers information, the one you put, 
the information so they are really small for temperature they are a little bit larger for uh polarization but that's just because you have much more noise in polarization okay so these are the main results uh combined the t and e you know, results for best signal to noise and remove this dipole distortion which means no information take account the mask and noise biases and we get then this kind of number. So you get velocities, which I measured from aberration. So this is on units of velocity for convenience, which is around 300, 390, or 320. Of course, this boosts again. I'm assuming that vibration and Doppler are in the same direction. So they're not so useful for measuring the intrinsic dipole because I'm already assuming that's kinematic. Okay, but it's a, it serves as a cross check. And Smith and Nuke, both pipelines give almost the same results really close so this is really reassuring to us that our pipeline is working that we got all these weights correctly and the doppler you know, the, the polar distortions well taken into account because the pipelines agree so well and the amount of systematics we see from the simulations at least is completely negligible so these are the main results um i this is a, it's a, it's a busy plot so let's go slow so the dipole is the star and these squares here are aberration and I have those results from Smith and Nuke, and they are most overlapping, as I showed very good agreement. The circles are the Doppler measurements. So the Doppler measurements do lie a, a, a little closer to the plane of the galactic plane, and not so far if you want from the hemispheric anomaly direction. But these are one sigma error bars for the Doppler here, and they are you now within one sigma of the dipole. Okay. And the aberration is really even better. And then you see that as I move the different colors is as I move different L max from 1000 to 1800 no point going beyond that. And you see that you know they, they, are, they are not going all over the place, they are kind of well converged you know they, they move slowly as you increase more data, but they are all around very, very well clustered. Okay, and the absolute values are here in the end from 300 390 around this. If you do assume a boost, which means dot aberration, they are in the same direction. So I have less degrees of freedom because they point in the same direction from as an assumption. Then this is a good serves as a cross check. And again, Smith and Nuke are in good agreement. They are all within one sigma of the dipole direction. And the precision is better because I have less degrees of freedom here. Okay. Now, uh, these are results of comparing simulation data. And uh, the real uh, the case where you have a, uh, you know assume that the, the dipole is kinematic is in purple, and the gray histograms is assuming that you have no correlation whatsoever. I mean, no aberration, no Doppler, and no dipole distortion. Okay, and then you see that you know the, the data really prefers the purple case. Okay, especially you know in the aberration case here you can really see with, you know, they have more uh, signal to noise. Let's summarize this in a table then. If you just want to know the hypothesis, I mean, I just want to measure whatever coupling is coming from aberration, Doppler, dipole, distortion, doesn't matter what, and see if they agree what they expect from that, from that. Then, oh, no, sorry. And then if I have no coupling whatsoever, then this is excluded at six sigma. Now, this is just a cross check if you want. Now, the aberration and Doppler measurements themselves are at smaller significance. Uh, the aberration is around three to four sigma, three and a half to four sigma detection. The Doppler, is around two to three sigma, so less than three sigma detection for Doppler, and the boost is what I want. No, this is the six, six sigma ish. If I just combine aberration and Doppler, but not assuming that they are in the same direction, then overall they have a four to four and a half sigma detection. And this is work done with my PhD student Pedro Ferreira. So what do we have? We have three vector observables. We have the dipole itself, we have the Doppler couplings and the aberration couplings. Three vectors. Right. And as I said, the Gaussian potential produces the same Doppler effect as velocity. So a simple, a simple parameterization that we did is just to put a, a scalar constant in alpha here, which is zero if you have a Gaussian you know, primordial dipole. And therefore, this beta D and delta one become degenerate. OK, so whatever, when I, if you can measure alpha different than zero, it means that you are measuring a non-Gaussian primordial dipole, something which is not compatible with single field low inflation. Uh, and Michael, the can you, Michael, can you uh, conclude in about one minute to stay in time? Okay, I thought okay, I thought I had thirty minutes, but okay, it doesn't matter. I, I, I can conclude in three. Okay, I, I rush. But anyway, you have a, some dipolar lensing effect, and the dipolar lensing effect is small. In lambda CDM, you, you can you know uh, you can estimate it from linear theory, and you can uh, it, this can be discarded. It's just a stochastic error you can take into account. Okay, so. 
Let's summarize this quickly. The results, we have a measurement of the intrinsic dipole, but it's consistent with zero with an amplitude less than three and a half, sorry, 3.6 millikelvin, which is you know, uh, the first time we put an upper bound in intrinsic contribution. Alpha is consistent with zero. And we have independent measurement of the velocity, which has no assumptions of kinematic dipole, okay? In the future, this can be improved with SMBS4 Simons Observatory, but I'm going to skip here this slide. Um, I'm just going to draw attention that this is being discussed here that because of velocity can be looked at other sources like radio galaxies. And uh, the, the dipole of radio galaxies are not in agreement with the CMB. They measure a, a dipole which is you know, in excess of 1,000 kilometers per second. And you can do peculiar velocity surveys in the nearby galaxies, and those are more consistent with the expected values, but there are lots of systematics and empirical power loss, in my opinion, that uh, no, uh, you have to use in this case. So I, th I think it's a little bit less uh, uh, simple on the control, but, uh, and the precision is not very large anyway. And, and with SKA in future, future radio continuum measurements, you can get, uh, uh, an, uh, and even with parallax, you can, get, you can get to 10% precision on these measurements, okay? So, um, so these are the i'm not going to go anymore but these are the uh, the radio dipole measurement is in black and the histograms what you expect from the cdm is in blue so there's a clear clear problem here going on in the radio uh, dipole now uh just uh one, two slides on the anomalies because this was mentioned by uh, yesterday i think Hutter was mentioned some of these and other people were mentioned so just a comment that you know as i said quadrupole octopole alignment hence very proximity the polar modulation all these three uh, of the Planck listed uh, anomalies, they are affected by our velocities. So a velocity can enter all three of them. On the quadrupole octopole alignment, they, you also have to take into account this Doppler distortion. Okay, it's the same thing here. It's a, it is a frequency dependent effect. So in our paper a few years ago, we corrected this uh, Doppler. We removed the Doppler quadrupole, but we removed them also removing the spurious contribution. Okay, and when you do that, the alignment, which goes from 1.6 to 2.6 sigma in different maps, they all go to 3 to 3.3 sigma. So the agreement is much better in different maps, which show you that you're doing something right, because the map should agree. They should not go all over the place. They should be measuring the same primordial uh, data. And the significance went up by correcting this Spurious effect, which is interesting. Um, finally, the last thing is that also the hemispherical, uh, so the dipolar modulation, uh, it also picks uh, an, a, a, a signal which is exactly the same signature as the Doppler couplings if your modulation is uh, independent of scale, right? So if you naively ignore these uh, kinematic correlations, you detect an spurious modulation. Now, these are results doing simulations without the velocity, simulations with the velocity and Planck data at different LMAX. If you go to the right, you see that if you go all the way to all scales of Planck, close to 2000, you do get no, no, no anomaly significance. But if you do ignore the velocity and don't remove it from your data, you get in a excess of three sigma, which is just good. So I'm not saying that's what people who study this anomaly is claiming. I'm just pointing out that you need to be careful about this uh, velocity. So to conclude, I'm sorry for I think I went a bit over time. Uh, if you remove this uh, dipolar distortions, you can measure independently aberration Doppler and the dipole. You know the new hypothesis excluded over six sigma. They are, the, the measurements are consistent with the kinematic dipole interpretation, so consistent with no intrinsic dipole. You have a first upper bound in the dipolar amplitude and an independent estimation of beta. And this is important because velocity is widely used in astronomy to convert the observed redshift into the cosmological redshift or CMB centric redshift. So if the velocity is wrong for some reason, you are having mistakes in all your redshifts. Okay. And finally, this kind of results is still no, not very highly significant, but they rule out some fine-tuned uh, kinematic explanation for the radio dipole because up to now, in principle, you could have a peculiar velocity which is thousand kilometers per second, then an intrinsic dipole which is contrary to this velocity, so the overall they partially cancel. You end up with the same dipole as a result, but this now is ruled, is ruled out. So thank you, obrigado, and uh, I wait for questions if there's time, or otherwise in the discussion session. Yeah, thanks for this very uh, highly detailed exposition. Maybe we have uh, time for one short question before we move to the second speaker. Yeah, uh, Dong Yu. Uh, thank you. Thank you for 
very nice talk. And I want to make sure that I understand this nature of this frequency dependence. So the Doppler shift, the, 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 the peculiar velocity effect, in terms of the intensity, it will just change Planck curve to Planck curve with different temperature. But you mean that, you, I, I think you, if I understand correctly, you mentioned that we use, because we use the brightness temperature, that's the reason why we have this Fourier frequency dependence. Is that correct? That's correct. I mean, if we have no velocity whatsoever, there's no velocity. We are at rest with respect to the CMB, but there's a dipole because, for instance, there is some intrinsic temperature fluctuation there. You would also see these LL plus one modes there. Uh, just because you, you are going from intensity to, so as you say, brightness temperature, if you want to be more precise, to temperature using a linear relation. And this is not exact. And then you pick up quadratic terms. And quadratic terms, if you have a, a dipole, whatever the dipole is, 10 to minus 3, there will be 10 to minus 3 uh, square terms. So 10 to minus 3 times whatever intrinsic perturbations you have. So you have 10 to minus 5, the intrinsic perturbations, coupled with 10 to minus 3, you're going to have 10 to minus, minus 8 effects, which is what we are measuring here. Okay, then if that's the case, why don't you use the full Planck curve instead of just brightness temperature to fit the temperature? The full, the problem? sorry, if I don't use the full what? Full Planck curve, the, the, the black body intensity curve with temperature. Oh, right, but then the point is, in principle, if you want to do this uh, correctly, you have to go all the way back to the time order data if you want to be really careful about this. So there's a couple of papers showing out. You know, once you build the maps, it's all in intensity there. It's not trivial to go back and go back and get the right result you can try i didn't try this it's a, I, I pondered this some time i'm not sure it's going to work because then you have to you have a full map which has all the noise all the problems it's already there and then you have to do transformations on this but the transformations will affect the noise will affect everything so uh, you might pick up cross terms right and i don't know how feasible it is to do that uh, and how reliable would that without going all the way? If you go back to the time of the data, then it's, and it's, it's, I don't see any reason. Some people here from Planck may correct me. I don't see any reason why this should not be should hard to do in principle because the, the satellite is pointing in some direction. So all the rings from Planck, you know what it's pointing to. So in principle, you know what it's pointing to and you know the, the angle with respect to the dipole is. So when you know you're pointing to, you, you can estimate what's the frequency shift there and remove it. There, right there, you do, you do a gain correction if you want on your, you know, bolometers, and then you can do the, this directly. You know, you know, okay, that's the intensity. I know what it is. I know what's the frequency I'm measuring. I know I can what's the black body temperature there. But if you don't do that on the time of the data, I, I'm, I'm worried how feasible it is. Okay. I, I yeah, think thank you. I think we have to move. There's obviously room for tremendous discussion, but. Uh, I think we have to move to the next speaker so and uh, leave, leave this excellent discussion for the discussion session. So uh, I would like to thank uh, Michael Quartin once again for his uh, very informative talk. And let's. I, I to have to make one propaganda. Sorry, 10 seconds. Is that for God? I don't know if you see the screen. But uh, there will be Cosmo 22 in Rio in August, so please save the date. I'm you can, you can show this slide during the discussion session too. No problem. We'll do. Okay. okay. Sorry, otherwise they kill me. I didn't propaganda. <laughs> well, yeah, don't worry. Um, so uh, I would like to invite uh, the next speaker, Xiao Chang Wang, to put up his slide. Uh, yes. And uh, yeah, I would like you to start off and please leave a few minutes for uh, questions yeah okay okay thank you for the invitation and the introduction i think i have to speak that so i'm Xiao Jiang. Uh, uh i'm a postdoctor at the institute of theoretical physics of chinese academy of science at beijing and i will talk about uh, today about hypertension and the local physics and this is based on the following three papers uh, uh on the uh, on the data between the data favor a local void chameleon dark energy can resolve the hypertension and a local guide for the hypertension. And there's a new paper we are coming out soon uh, 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 to refresh our previous work on the local guide for the hypertension, but we had a perturbative analysis. Um, okay, this is the outline of my talk. So in the first part, I will talk about the current standards of hypertension and what, we, and what we can learn from it, uh, both from observational and theoretical standards. Uh, in the second part, I will talk about the uh, work uh, I introduced uh, on the local under density and the local over density at a local non-concrete. 
And the convert message that I'm trying to give will be discussed during the talk. So let's look at the observational status on the global model feeding. And the global model feeding on the hub constant is obtained by feeding the same bit data, for example, uh, to the lambda CDM model. The red quantity are the six phase parameter that we can direct mirror. And the green part, the green quantity are the derived parameter. And all the unknown quantity is the blue quantity, which is the, uh, the physical fraction of energy. Uh, this could be obtained by matching the theta star to the mirror value. And once you know this omega lambda, we can set the z to zero and get half a constant from the CMP data with the lambda CDM model. However, even without the same data, we can also constrain the Hubble constant on the combination of BIO with BBN if we really appreciate the de degeneracy between the Hubble constant and the effective number of degree of freedom. Um, and the results are consistent with the same B results. Uh, however, there are some anomalies for the global feeding if we just look at the small scale uh, CMB data or the polarization data as shown by these red tangulars. Uh, which deviated from the standard temperature spectrum uh, 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 significantly. And yeah, you can download this plot from our website. And uh, let me move to uh, all the rest of the measurements uh, with color other than red are the local measurements. So let's move to the uh, local measurements. Uh, the power magnitude is related to the absolute magnitude with the luminosity distance. And this could be decomposed into the Hubble constant dependent part and the Hubble cup constant independent part. Now, with the mirror value of the absolute magnitude from the distant ladder, we can uh, fit the lambda CDM model to the, uh, to the supernova in the Hubble flow and get the, the Hubble constant from lambda CDM model. Uh, we can also throw in all different kind of the late time model as done in this paper and then fit the supernova data and get the, a model dependent Hubble constant. However, the results are concentrated around the same thing four. And so this is why Reyes claimed that his uh, local measurements from this ladder is quasi-local independent. Uh, we can also measure the Hubble constant without this ladder, for example, with the strong length intent delay. And however, the mirrored Hubble constant is highly sensitive to the 3D density profile of the lens scales, uh, which is very difficult to measure. And a second example of the distant, uh, a second example without the distant ladder is the Grand Central Wave standard siren and the dark standard siren. However, they are still suffer from a very large uncertainty. So let's look at the CRS standards. Uh, the simple extension of the lambda CDM model has been tested to be insufficient to overcome the Hubble discrepancy as done by Riz earlier. And even without the CMB data, we can also show this conclusion with BO plus VN plus supernova and the simple extension of lambda CDM model are still not sufficient to overcome this Hubble discrepancy. Uh, therefore, we go beyond the simple extension of the lambda CDM model, for example, the early time solutions from changing expansion history or the recombination history. Uh, we can also have the late time solutions from uh, in from the homogeneous and inhomogeneous modifications. Uh, recently, there's a, a rising interest in the hybrid solution, for example, the early familiar dark energy and early dark energy with decaying dark matter. So let's look at the theoretical status on the early time solutions. Uh, recently, there's some debates over the early time solution, for example, in this paper, uh, a full consistency between the CMB counter, BLO band, and the local measurement uh, allowed us to uh, get a higher value of H0 uh, with decreasing our uh, sound horizon, but at the price of a larger and larger omega ml square. And with larger, larger omega ml square, we get a much worse uh, this SA tensions. And furthermore, there's a, a very interesting and a consistent trend in the data. So the model with a, a low omega ml square, so as a fair, to achieve a high H0 or intention with the BAO data. And the model with a higher omega m square, uh, they will be intention with the gas, uh, with the gas uh, uh, lensing data. Uh, this is very general argument. And this has, this has already obtained earlier than that paper in these three papers. And there's some other evidence, for example, 
uh, the consistent test of the sound horizon between the matter radiation quality and the recombination. And there's a, a consistent test for the sound horizon between the recombination and the end of drug epoch. So there, there is really not much room for us to modify the early time universe, but still there's nothing to prevent us uh, to constructing some hybrid model that also suppress the matter clustering at the late time. So let's look at the theoretical status of the late time solutions. Uh, this is very important, uh, 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 very important conclusion for the uh, an ongoing argument from the inverse inverse distance ladder. So the inverse distance ladder combine the BAO uh, with the supernova, but with a CMP prior on the sound horizon, and this gave us a half constant. Uh, know that uh, the sound horizon is mainly determined by the early universe. Uh, uh, e evolution, uh, so therefore it's independent of the late time model, and therefore it is unharmful for us to use the uh, uh, a sound horizon prior uh, to discriminate the late time model. Uh, to actually implement this inverse distance ladder, we actually assume uh, the, uh, a Planck prior on the sound horizon, let's say 174 megapascals, and some form an logical uh, this FG model assumption. And then we fit uh, this combined VLO with the supernova data, and very importantly, with a strong de determination of the, uh, the absolute magnitude. And this will lead to a very strong constraint on the late time uh, universe to be a barely deviated from the lambda CDM uh, within the ratio of 0 0.01 to 1. And you might wonder that uh, if there is a, a such uh, a phantom transition, uh, below z point uh, z equal to 0 0.01 and, and then still maintain the success um, higher than 0 0.01 so could this solution work uh well this cannot be done for free as shown recently in this paper uh, the price to pay is that uh, you have to deviate uh, uh, this uh, absolute magnitude significantly from the value you derive a locally higher half constant so we are, we are actually running into a tension with MB. Well, nevertheless, the inverse distance ladder argument for the late time solution could escape if we allowed for <clears throat> late time inhomogeneous solution, for example, a large local void as, ex as explicitly seen uh, by I in the gas survey data. However, uh, the supernova data show something otherwise. They do not prefer a large local void. <clears throat> So let's introduce our work. Uh, let me introduce our first work on the local voice in this paper. Uh, so in this paper, we made a global feeding of a GBH profile as shown in this shape uh, to the four uh, patient data. And here the global feeding means that we feed over all three parameters of the GBH profile. And yet we find uh, no evidence for large local void in the patient uh, supernova data with the GBH profile in the lambda LTD model. Uh, we also compare the results from fitting all three GBH uh, parameters uh, with the result fitting only GBH depth parameter and fitting all the other GBH parameter at the KBC void value. And yet we find uh, there's a no preference of the lambda, uh, lambda LTD model with the void over the lambda CDM model. Okay, let me introduce our second word on the chameleon dark energy uh, from a local over density in this paper. So the physical picture is fairly simple. Uh, the, the, the effective potential of the chameleon field consists of the people ratio potential and the daliton coupling to the local matter density. And the chameleon uh, field is actually uh, therefore trapped uh, at this local minima uh, playing the role of dark energy. So it's easy to see that for a uh, for chameleon fields in the high density regions, they will have higher vacuum energy than in the low density region. So therefore, the high density regions will expand locally faster than the low density region. Uh, to see quality, uh, to see precisely uh, uh, this mechanism, let's uh, make example of the toy model with top hat profile. And you can see that a 10% over density uh, could give us uh, 17. Uh, 
value for F0, then if I allow for 20% local over density, you will get a 73, 74. And this perfectly give us uh, the current local environment. However, for the realistic world, uh, we model our local universe uh, as a series share, as a tropic but inhomogeneous share with the LTP matrix. And the boundary condition is that the average matter density of the share at a spatial infinity uh, should recover the same B result. And this matter density of the shares is actually biased from the Gallus number density. And counting, uh, so this Gallus, this Gallus number density, uh, just counting the net excess of the data Gallus with respect to some uh, the mock Gallus in the random sample. And uh, the counting scheme and the weighting scheme are the same as both group. And we also adopt the bias results from this paper. Uh, the final result is that so we find that uh, the, the local matter density in the South Galaxy cap is actually a little bit higher than the North local, uh, the North uh, Galaxy cap, uh, as shown in this paper at different ratio, uh, at different uh, radius. Okay, the final result for the Hubble constants uh, could be obtained once we know this uh, omega m profile. And uh, as you can see, that uh, the Hubble constant from the south part is actually higher than the north part, and the south part perfectly match uh, the supernova measurements. You may ask a question: Why the south part? Well, most of the known supernova are actually found uh, in the uh, in the south part. And so it's so uh, it's not strange that we find a higher value of, uh, uh, of Hubble constants from this part. And more generally speaking, the supernova actually born in the high density region. So no wonder we find a larger edge knot from supernova as an expansion indicator. There's also <clears throat> intriguing trend in the Hubble constant from this two paper. Uh, the infrared Hubble constant is decreasing with redshift. Uh, this is understandable from our model because we approximate the local density as a series as a tropic LTP share, averaging over the matter density fragmentation, uh, which is decreasing when we go in outward. So this is why we see a decreasing trend in the Hubble constant measured from a more and more distant expansion indicator. Uh, however, I have to admit that an isotropic LTP share is by no means a good approximation of the local density. But um, a case-by-case -case study for the local density determination for each supernova is almost impossible. So this is a long-term goal that we want to achieve. Uh, so uh, let me introduce our third work uh, on the, uh, the non-con argument, uh, on the improved non-con argument uh, for the late time model. So to improve the local distance ladder, uh, we know that uh, the late time parameterization for the HD uh, from the tail expansion is actually not converged at a larger redshift. And also the H0 tension or the MB tension or even the SA tension is actually uh, very sensitive to the model dependence MB prior on the sound horizon. So in here, we adopt a new parameterization based on the cosmic age. So here P page, Page is the combination of H naught times T naught. T naught is the age, the current age of our universe. And eta is the parameter to categorize the deviation from a matter dominant universe. And there are some advantage for this new parameterization. The first, uh, this allowed us to uh, consistently use the cosmic age data, uh, namely the CC data. Uh, since we we explicitly use the cosmic age. And second, uh, this is a global parameterization of the cosmic history, a valid way beyond the tail expansion domain. And third, this also cover a large class of late time model with high accuracy over a very large range of redshift. And last, we don't need any inputs of the, uh, uh, the prior on the sun horizon or the absolute magnitude when fitting to, for example, the standard siren, Pro standard ruler, pro standard clock. So you can see explicitly from this plot uh, uh, for different uh, distant layers, uh, this uh, HD, DL, 
and TM, TV, TH. So uh, the red line uh, is, our is our page approximation to lambda CDM model. The blue and the green line are the tail expansion to the lambda CDM model. Uh, the solid line, actually, the exact value, the exact uh, lambda CDM model. And here, the tail expansion in Y uh, is, uh, uh, is computed in this quantity. As, as you can see, that for a large, for all the uh, for all this situation I list, you know, uh, uh, the page approximations uh, fits the lambda system models over a large redshift range. Okay, this precise measure, this precise matching of the page approximation is not limited to the lambda system model. Uh, you can also match other late time model uh, in the page theoretical parameter space uh, by some matching uh, procedure. And uh, the precision is very high, as you can see from here. To actually use this uh, page approximation, we can solve this equation with this uh, HZ uh, definition, uh, different ratio. And then you solve this equation uh, of H naught T as a pure function of Z uh, uh, in terms of the page parameter eta and the page. And then you plot this uh, dispersion in here and you get the final uh, dimension is have a uh, have expansion rate in terms of uh, the, the page parameter. So in the page parameter uh, parameter space, uh, we can map different uh, a different model at this uh, at this uh, plot, and uh, you can change the CPL uh, CPL par parameterization with dark energy, the curvature, and the matter density. You can also change uh, both of two to uh, get uh, this plot. Uh, in particular, the George work on the phantom dark energy transition at that time is mapped in this shape. So we fit uh, this uh, uh, page uh, par par parameterization and the lambda CDM model to the, uh, uh, to the supernova plus BAO plus CC data. Uh, there's a two different uh, set of the CC data. But uh, no matter what CC data we use, uh, you can see that the difference between the page approximation of the late time model to the lambda CDM model is negligible. So there's no evidence to go beyond the lambda CDM model. And this is our, our final results. You can see no matter uh, what CC data we use in this data combination, uh, the difference between the lambda CDM model and the page model is negligible. And uh, uh, it worth noting that uh, we also uh, find uh, the contour constraint for our page uh, parameter space. And you can find that most of the phase dark energy transition at the late time is, other, is actually ruled out in this contour. So let me uh, make a very quick conclusion and discussion. So uh, generally speaking, there's a two possibility for the current status of power tension. Uh, uh, which is real or not real. So if it is real, then we have some kind of a solution. And yet the, the no-gum argument for the early time solution and uh, the no-gum argument for the late time solution from investigation ladder and also our improved no-gum argument uh, shows that if this is really true, then you have to construct some exotic early dark energy model or the hybrid model. But there's another possibility that if the hypothesis is not real, then maybe this is caused by systematics and we get a happy ending if all the measurement become consistent, consistent. But there's another systematics, and, and I quote this systematics, uh, because um, maybe uh, all the measurements uh, mirror the have a constant correctly, separately, but still they still maintain divergence uh, uh, value. So this will force us into a situation that maybe the have a constant is actually environment dependent have a constant. So in this so in this talk, I highlight our work to break the local FRW metric to construct a chameleon dark energy model. And it's also possible that to break another uh, cosmic principle, uh, for example, that the isotropy. So, so there's a second possibility in here. Okay, um, yeah, I'm here. I'm ready to take questions. Okay, thank you for your uh, uh, overview and also for staying very uh, nicely on time. So there's definitely room for at least one question. I see a hand up by Eon. 
Yeah, actually, it's more common than anything else, right? So you can argue that if you, you work with an FLRW cosmology and, you know, allow any early dark energy you like or anything that changes the sound horizon, that you would only get to 71 as a central value for H0 and maybe plus or minus one. Now, Reese is at 70, what, 73 plus or minus, I think, 1.2? 73.2. 1. Yeah. yeah, something like that. So they're within two sigma, but still there is a... I mean, okay, 73 and 71 are not exactly the same, right? They're well within two sigma. Um, uh, yes. I mean, so in some sense, it does seem like there is room for something beyond FLRW if, you know, local H0 values come in at 73 or higher, right? Mm. And then you've got to yeah, factor uh, in that early dark energy tends to make uh, other stuff worse, right? Yes. Yeah. And maybe you can comment on that. Uh, so I have to uh, point out that uh, this is a very uh, a roughly approximation for the local density. So we just approximate the local density in the shear, but uh, in fact, we cannot uh, actually approximate the local density in shear because they, every, uh, every distant indicator have their own local density, and we should use that density to compute uh, the Hopper constants we infer from that distant indicator. So this just gives you a general picture of this result. Uh, for example, uh, this- But, but, but this is a model dependent statement, right? So yeah, what I was making was a model independent statement, right? Uh, that we gave is, in May, um, uh, in our paper from May, right? So it's, it's essentially agnostic. It's, it's a very loose framework. Um, uh, yes. okay. But assumes mm. GR, of course. Um, so if you, you, you're winning GR, and you assume, you know, an expansion in terms of Z and you assume like, okay, we know the age of the universe and some other things, then really you mm -hmm. can't go beyond 71. And so if you look at early, like some concrete early dark energy models, they're more or less at 71 plus or minus one. I don't expect uh, yeah, things to go yeah, higher yeah, than that. Yeah, uh, yeah you're right. Um, and yeah. so do you, do you think this, so obviously you have a model that is basically non-FLRW, but do you think this is a, you know, this could be a potential yeah, uh, way out? Yeah, we cannot say that uh, uh, the early dark energy model is uh, fully uh, ruled out because there's still some room to modify it by adding some late time modification to suppress the matter clustering. So yeah, it's not set down yet. You are right. Okay, thanks. I have a related uh, comment. You briefly mentioned in one of your earlier slides, uh, Yedomtik 2021. And they are with, uh, uh, Pogosian and uh, Tsang. Uh, they are uh, strongly highlighting that one should combine late time cosmology considerations with the BAO as an early time constraint. I didn't mm -hmm. quite see that combination reflected in your uh, conclusions. Can you comment on this? Uh, yes, our, our local argument is only applied to the late time model, uh, not the early time model. So I cannot say much thing about early time model from our paper uh, here. Uh, sorry, yeah. So Morris, I think okay. there's some hybrids that are mentioned right on that slide, right? So uh, I think yeah, those yeah, are the papers yeah, we that can, if you yeah, have your yeah, slide. We cannot, right? Yeah, we cannot uh, ruin out a hybrid model. Mm -hmm. I, I recently looked at uh, that uh, suggestion and I found it to be a very, uh, useful comment that indeed you can get some interesting results if you push that to deriving, practically speaking, fairly uncorrelated constraints from the BAO and late time cosmology on your favorite background model. Yes. Yes, this is practically what um, we do in our paper, but use a different uh, model independent par parameterization. Yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, what omega m then do you get? Do you get an omega m estimate slightly less than canonical lambda CDM? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so this depends on the CC data we use. For example, in here, you get uh, omega m uh, consistent with the CMB data, uh, a CMB constraint, and this is more, more likely the local, the local value we use. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but the point is that no matter which 
data set we use, the difference between the page model and the lambda change model is negligible. So, right. uh, yeah. Okay, thanks for your uh, talk. We have to move yeah, on to you. uh our last speaker this morning. And of course, we will uh gladly receive your further questions in the discussion session. So now we'll move to uh Tamara Davis, and she will teach us about inhomogeneous impacts on cosmology. Please go ahead. Thanks very much. Hi, everybody. Uh so yes, my my title's not terribly informative. I was um, looking at, at some of the ways in inhomogeneities can impact our general cosmology, even if Lambda CDM is our correct model. Um, but first, thanks very much to the uh, conference organizers for inviting me along to give this talk. I think it's been a really interesting set of talks so far. And it was like some really uh, original and sort of foundational ideas that are being probed. So I think it's really important to ask all of these questions. Um, the stuff I'll be talking about today has been done in collaboration with many people, a bit like Dragon said the other day, I've, I've worked on inhomogeneous, inhomogeneous cosmologies more so a little bit in the, the past. So I'm gonna talk about some old results of mine as well as some new stuff. And I haven't tried to review the field in any way. So apologies, I know there's a lot of work that's been done that I'm not gonna include on these type of areas. I'm sort of focusing on what some of the stuff that we've done with our collaborators, um, many of whom are listed here. Um, so first I'm, I'm speaking from Australia and when we do this, we usually give an acknowledgement of country as we begin our talks. So I'd like to acknowledge the Turbul and Yagara nations. Uh, and one of the cool things that I really like about Aboriginal astronomy is that some of the constellations that they make are out of the dark patches in the sky as opposed to the bright stars. So the Emu in the Milky Way is the classic constellation that comes from sort of the Aboriginal lore. Um, so I think that's cool since we, a lot of us study dark energy and dark matter. It's also related to the inhomogeneities in the sky actually, isn't it? So anyway, starting along, uh, you know, the, the overall thought is that the cosmological principle is very philosophical, ap philosophically appealing, but philosophically appealing does not necessarily mean that it's true. Uh, we have seen other philosophically appealing uh, ideas, such as the, the perfect cosmological principle, which one would argue is more uh, philosophically appealing in that the universe is not only homogeneous and isotropic, but also the same at all times. Uh, and uh, that resulted in things like the steady state theory, um, which just simply doesn't match our observations. And of course, mathematics is full of beautiful um, uh, systems that just aren't realized in, um, in nature. So it's important for us to poke all of the things and, and see what's actually, what actually works, what sort of philosophical basis is actually valid for our universe. Um, and the, the sort of point that I'm going to look at for most of this talk is also is a lot of, you know, there's a lot of um, questioning whether we live in a Lambda CDM universe. I'm going to look at the perspective of if we do, how do the inhomogeneities affect our observations? Because even if we do live in a Lambda CDM universe, there's, we know that the inhomogeneities are affecting what we see. In fact, we use the inhomogeneities as most of the probes that we use. So um, how can they affect some of our observations? So in this talk, I'll actually start with um, a, a sort of a, a 10 year old measurement now that we made um, where we tried to measure the scale of homogeneity with Wiggles galaxies the, from the Wiggles Dark Energy Survey. Uh, and then look at some of these impact of inhomogeneities on cosmology, including large bulk flows, what it means to converge on the CMB dipole, because this has just come up a couple of times lately, and mostly about sort of some of the observational errors I'm worried about and hopefully dismissed, um, but some persist and there are, I know there are errors in some uh, data sets that we just have to be aware of. So I'll just talk through a few of those. So first, measuring the scale of homogeneity. We know from Roy's talk yesterday that this is technically impossible. Uh, we can only see on our past light cone. We can't actually measure the homogeneity scale without making some sort of assumptions about the, the things that we're uh, looking at. Um, so in many ways, this is a self-consistency check. Um, the one thing that we need to do is calculate distances from redshift. 
Um, I'll note that we do that with FLRW uh, metric and the Friedman um, uh, equations, but you know you could also just say, okay, let's just empirically see that there's a smooth luminosity uh, redshift distance with the supernovae, for example, and sort of there it would be hard to explain that without having a luminal a distance redshift relation that's quite similar to the one that comes from theory. So there's sort of an observational basis for that as well as a theoretical one. Um, yeah, and we'll, while it's a self-consistency check, we'll also look at ways to see whether we would have seen something if it was, uh, if we were not in a homogeneous universe. Um, oh yeah, um, I almost forgot. Some of the talks yesterday reminded me of this, so I thought I'd chuck it in quickly. I think of um, this idea as, some, as the uncertainty principle of the universe, somewhat, where we need to be able to observe a big enough patch of the universe in order to measure the homogeneity scale, for example. But as the bigger that we make the patch, the less uh, the more homogeneous but it becomes, but the more like time evolution you have because you're looking along the past light cone. So you're looking at, you're averaging densities of the universe at different times effectively. Uh, and so you can actually look at, uh, I actually got Brianna, one of my undergrad students to do a quick little project on this to see sort of what was the optimal, the, the minimum uncertainty you could get to do an, a measurement of density uh, in principle, uh, given the time variation of density. You know, there's lots of caveats and stuff, and I've made this sort of small so you can't really uh, see because there's a lot of things that we need to add to this, but I like the sort of the concept of the uncertainty principle of the universe. It's actually something that came up when chatting to Matthew Collett in a long drive back from uh, the telescope here when we used to do those kinds of things in person. Okay, so the measuring the scale of homogeneity. What do we mean by this? So this we did with the Wiggles Dark Energy Survey. We had about 250,000 galaxies um, covering a cubic gigaparsec. And the cool thing about this was it was the largest volume sample at the time that was really large enough for um, sort of one of the first times to be able to really um, extend well beyond what we think the scale of homogeneity should be in Lambda CDM. So what we did was the very simple measurement of counting galaxies in spheres, basically. So you pick a point starting on a galaxy in the middle and count how many neighbors it has, and you take bigger and bigger spheres. And if things are homogenous, the number of galaxies within that sphere should go up with the volume. So it should go up in proportion to the radius cubed. So D2 is called the correlation dimension or the fractal dimension. And if, that, if D2 is equal to three, then that's the, um, that means you're in a homogeneous uh, universe on average. Uh, as at, at small scales, you won't be homogeneous. So we expect that, you know, if you go along a fil filament, as you increase the volume of a sphere, it will only increase linearly with um, scale factor. Uh, sorry, not with scale factor, with radius. Uh, and so D2 will be one. And I think uh, David Parkinson showed these at the very, in the very first talk of the, um, of the thing. These were, these come from Morag Scrimgeour's, um, some of Morag Scrimgeour's talks and her paper on this back in 2012. Uh, so we had to think about how to define homogeneity, like what do we practically mean? Because we only expect the distribution to asymptote to homogeneity, not really actually reach it. Uh, and so if you, other people had looked at ways of defining this and, and used the size of the error bars on the measurement at a particular radius to say, if your error bars were within um, the scale of homogeneity or within 1% of it or whatever, then you could call that homogenous. But that makes it very survey dependent and the size of your error bars matter. Um, so we did a way where we fit the, um, the data um, with, uh, um, just a polynomial and looked at where that crossed the line where you were within 1% of homogeneity and then did uh, many realizations of this kind of um, uh, measurement to get the estimated uncertainty in that measurement. And so we defined it as this rather arbitrarily as within 1% of homogeneity or within 1% within of D2 being equal to three um, as our homogeneity scale. So I'll get into that sort of what the implications of that are in a um, moment as well. So this is an example of one of the redshift slices and the measurement that Morag made. Uh, and so the black points of the data 
you can see that in this case, the homogeneity, homogeneity scale was measured to be 70 plus or minus 5 H, H inverse megaparsecs. Um, and the, the red line is the polynomial fit. The blue line is a lambda CDM model um, in which the, the homogeneity scale was would have been predicted to be 78 H inverse megaparsecs. Um, one thing to note is that the lambda CDM model matches the functional form of this really, really well. So regardless of exactly where you would call this line of homogeneity, um, the, the shape that we see in this um, uh, data really fits what we would expect, the sort of convergence from going from small scales where you have filaments and clusters to large scales where you're relatively homogeneous. Um, we also did this at many, uh, at four different redshifts and get, um, got quite similar results. One thing I'll note that is in the CMB models, the one thing that's very dependent here is the bias of the galaxies that you're looking at. So if you calculate theoretically the number that you expect within a sphere of radius R, then that's related to the correlation function of your theory um, um, and the bias of your galaxies. So if you have more strongly biased galaxies, um, it takes longer to get to homogeneity. Uh, so that's what, one thing that has to be fit for each of the different redshift slices, which is different. Also note that the baryon acoustic oscillation scale is larger than the scale of homogeneity, and certainly in the way that we've defined it here. Um, and that's just noting that the BAO feature is less than a 1% deviation from homogeneity which is why you need hundreds of thousands of galaxies as a minimum in order to be able to measure it precisely. Uh, and um, also things like the slowing great wall, which is on the order of 300 um, megaparsecs. It's, um, but even something that large is sort of negligible when you consider the fluctuation it contributes to a volume of that diameter. Um, so while we've mentioned that the homogeneity scale is something close to, you know, a little bit under uh, 100 um, H inverse megaparsecs, it's um, dependent on the bias of the galaxies. And also you can have significant structures larger than that scale of homogeneity, and that's consistent with lambda cedium as well. Uh, importantly, we wanted to ask the question of would we notice any inhomogeneity? Um, and one of the important things when doing these galaxy surveys is you account for incompleteness using random catalogs. Now that sort of effectively assumes that there's homogeneity in the unobserved regions. And since there's holes and patches in the, the actual distribution of galaxies, that would tend to bias you towards homogeneity potentially. So if the data was too incomplete or had too small a volume, you could be fooled into seeing homogeneity when there isn't any. So um, Morag did a bunch of simulations where we put fractal models in, put the same selection function on as our Wiggles galaxies and tested what um, correlation dimension we would recover. And so the input chip made fractal models with different um, correlation dimensions where those are the horizontal dashed lines here um, and the recovered ones are what you get here. So uh, you can see that as expected, as you get close to the sort of scale of the survey and stuff, these tend to overestimate the, the correlation dimension, um, but they don't come uh, particularly close to getting the um, correlation dimension of three. So if there was fractal structure on these sorts of scales, we expect that we should have been able to see it. And I do note that this all still assumes a distance redshift relation. So even when we're testing the fractal models there. So we think that would have been, we should, that should have been noticed. So that was the sort of measurement of homogeneity. Um, another thing was that we looking at the um, size of bulk flows. Now I have been doing a bunch of this because I've been looking at peculiar velocities for um, supernova cosmology and the corrections that are needed for supernova cosmology and figuring out exactly what we want to do for the, um, the cosmologies outside of the, um, the region that we have peculiar velocity corrections for and also looking at the uncertainties of the peculiar velocity corrections that we do make um, that are at low redshift. Um, but anyway, the, the um, long and the story short of it is that um, the, this is sort of the bulk flow correction, bulk flow expected as a function of radius. And we note again, this well beyond the scale of what we called homogeneity, when we're within 1% of homogeneity, you still have quite significant bulk flows. 
So just because your sort of density is within 1% of homogeneity doesn't mean you have uh, your outside of the region of where there's large bulk flows. Um, you'll notice the measurements that we did in this in Morag's paper here, uh, the, the radius of the volume that we're looking at was at the tail of this arrow, but the sort of effective volume would have been a sphere of radius smaller than this. Um, and so we, um, the data points that appear on this plot, which are generally showing that most people measure a slightly higher bulk flow than expected, um, are, there's caveats on this in several ways. One, this, the model prediction depends on the window function that you use. Um, and so you can't really actually put all of these data points to comparing to this same model that really should only be compared to the model that we're, to the data points that are read here because they're, they use the same window function as, the, this, um, as this prediction. Uh, and also the effective volume, if you don't have a sphere of that radius, the effective volume should be smaller. So exactly what the radius is of the bulk flow measurements that you're making um, is a little bit tricky to calculate if you don't have a 100% full coverage of a sphere. Um, we did a, a measurement with Per Anderson, who looked at um, whether how that it noted that it's very actually easy to overestimate bulk flows. And this was just a, a paper, mostly uh, again aimed at looking at the supernova data. When if you're trying to measure a dipole from supernova data and you have numbers something on the order of 500, uh, if again if you don't have a full sky survey then you can badly overestimate your um, bulk flows. And so it's pretty much, it's simply just an incompleteness um, uh, measure. And they showed that you either need large numbers um, or as much of the coverage of the area of the sky as possible in order to um, get accurate bulk flows from this. So that's just a, another like small detail to mention. Uh, so I mentioned I would talk about what it means to converge on the CMB dipole because this is uh, something that's come up a few times and has caused confusion into some of the discussions that I've been having. So I thought I should try and clarify one small thing. I'm sure that everybody here probably already um, understands this perfectly, but since it's caused confusion for a bunch of conversations that I've had with people recently, I thought I'd mention it. Um, if we're talking about bulk flows, they should not converge on the CMB dipole in either direction or uh, magnitude as you go to larger and larger spheres. So what I'm talking about with bulk flows is you've got our motion with respect to the CMB and then as you go to a bigger sphere you might have our galaxy's motion which is in a slightly different direction with respect measured with respect to the CMB background. And then as you average all of the velocities in a bigger sphere, that has a slightly different direction and magnitude with respect to the CMB. And as you average over bigger and bigger spheres, this um, should be expected to go to a peculiar velocity of zero, but it doesn't need to go in the direction of the CMB dipole. So when you look at these, that plot that I had before of the predicted bulk flow as the magnitude decreases, that's expected, but um, there it has popped up in some papers that some people say, and the, and the direction of that should converge on the CMB dipole. But our CMB dipole is very peculiar to our own local motion. It shouldn't have anything to do with the um, average um, direction of a very large um, bulk flow. Um, on the other hand, our dipole, our dipole with respect to distant galaxies is expected to converge on the CMB dipole and direction. And we've seen some very interesting talks by people here showing that it doesn't tend to do this as much as, as we would expect. So um, if you measure our um, velocity with respect to bigger and bigger spheres, it will change direction and stuff. But the final one measured against the biggest sphere um, of, the, of galaxies is the one that should converge to the CMB dipole. Now that's probably obvious to everybody, but as I said, it's caused some confusion. So I just thought I should clarify the difference between these two things because they sometimes get confused. Um, okay, so the last thing that I wanted to chat about quickly was some observational errors. I've been involved with some redshift surveys and so I've been looking at ways in which we can stuff up. And so this is my sort of, uh, sort of worst case scenario type of parts of the talk. 
Um, so obviously we can have observational error and measurements and different different ways. Um, there's physical effects that will cause redshift errors, which are not really errors, they're just um, they're physical effects that we have to take into account. Um, and then there's theoretical errors, which really are errors where we could cause some systematic problems by um, doing various things incorrectly. Um, so starting with physical effects, um, this was a paper led by Radek Wojtek, who um, looked at the, uh, the gravitational redshifts that we get from objects, because as we look out at this inhomogeneous universe that we have here, the, um, we are not actually receiving light from the average density of the universe all the time. We're receiving it primarily from galaxies, which will tend to be in gravitational wells. Uh, and of course, we are also in a gravitational well, so that might cancel out, but it might not. So um, we had a quick look at this just to make sure that this was not something to worry about. And indeed, it's only on the order of five by 10 to the minus five, sort of in a worst case scenario. So um, this effect, I think, is too small to worry about when we're talking about most of the inhomogeneous measurements that we're, that we're looking at. Um, of course, then there's peculiar velocity effects, uh, which we are all very familiar with. Uh, and the, uh, there was some theoretical mistakes in some early papers that, uh, but they're not, it was fine when we were working at low redshift, but you often see, um, you know, that this is true that the total velocity is the recession velocity plus the peculiar velocity. And some at low redshift, you can say that that's approximately the speed of light times the observed redshift. And you often see in peculiar velocity papers, this equation which uh, is uh, definitely bad. Um, so, because if you imagine if you had a peculiar velocity and you used uh, V total equals CZ, uh, if you had a peculiar velocity of zero, it looks like a small variation if you plot it like this. But if you plot it um, on a more clear plot, uh, you can see that you'd overestimate your peculiar velocities by 700 kilometers per second at redshift of 0.1. So if you're looking at uh, so there's potential overestimates of peculiar velocities if you do this. I don't think it, people are doing this these days, but this was just a... Actually, Tamara, um, can I just jump in and just, um, yeah. like, so you mentioned NED, I think, yesterday in a comment, right? And there is a calculator on NED that seems to get this wrong, but a lot of NED tables as well, they do seem to quote redshift and then V, even though the redshift is 1 or 1 1.5 or something like that. It's kind of crazy, right? Yes, absolutely. So we had a paper this last, this year, um, that was led by Anthony Carr. Um, and we have talked to the NED um, team about this and they're hopefully going to update their calculators and things like that. Um, so the, um, but it's definitely a problem. And so the thing that you can see in that the NED peculiar velocity calculator does make this error. Um, and uh, also if you look at the NED peculiar velocities, so, um, uh, it's been very gratifying to see that pretty much everybody uh, in this conference is using this formula, um, but the, you know, this low redshift approximation where you add redshifts misses this um, cross term uh, and things like the NED velocity calculator do this. Uh, and so you can actually, this is from Anthony's paper, um, you can see the, this plot where the, the lines are the it, the error that you would make if you use the additive correction. And this was just a plot showing that, um, yes, Ned makes this additive correction. Uh, and this, this in particular is for doing the heliocentric to CMB correction. So um, if you're converting to the CMB frame, then you see this. Um, and this gives a 10 to the minus three error at a redshift of one. Uh, and so this can cause some um, issues. If you're, if it doesn't matter so much um, for some applications, but if you're looking at really detailed uh, applications as we're trying to do for cosmology in these days, um, and so for deviations in different parts of the sky, and for anything that happens to align with our direction of motion, then just be aware that this is in many data sets and in um, and in many tools like Ned. So yeah, thanks for the question. That was exactly what I was about to um, talk about. Yeah, so what, watch out for this one. Um, also, the uh, I'll wrap up in a second. The redshifts um, do pop in in some unexpected ways, potentially. Um, so 
if you're looking at luminosity and angular diameter distance as well, um, you do need both the CMB frame and the observed redshift because the things that make them luminosity and angular diameter distances um, are effects that are just are dependent on the redshift. And so those terms that are outside the cosmological distance are um, should be the observed redshift, but you need the cosmological redshift in order to theoretically calculate the distance. So that can um, uh, arise and cause issues. Um, and I'll also note that if you're using supernova data, if you change the redshift, you can't just naively use the magnitude um, for cosmology. You need to go and recalculate the magnitude because the things like the K corrections that are done are um, dependent on redshift. And so you end up with different magnitudes if you have different redshifts so for the supernovae. Um, and that means that, and in, if you look at it, the impact on cosmology, it actually cancels out some of the, the variation that you would see, would see in cosmology if you just use the raw distance moduli. Okay, so I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll skip these ones. I was just going to note that um, if you're looking at doing H naught from gravitational waves, one of my postdocs, Colin Howlett, um, and a bunch of other people actually as well, also looked at the peculiar velocity corrections that are done when you're for the, the standard siren measurement that was, was initially made. And I'll skip through this because I've run out of time. Uh, but just to note that the peculiar velocity correction in this one particular measurement is on the order of seven kilometers per second. Um, and so it's important, uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec in the measurement of H0. So it's important to get it right. Uh, and uh, But this importance decreases as you get more and more um, standard sirens with which to measure this. So it will become, uh, this peculiar velocity correction as you average over many areas in the sky will become less important with time just as it has with supernovae. And I'll just skip over these results uh, in the interest of time and head to my summary, which is that I showed the measurements that we made with the Wiggles galaxies that shows the density field of the universe does look like it converges towards statistical homogeneity. Um, and then the note that inhomogeneity is imp imprinted on all of our measurements in one way or another. Uh, and it's becoming increasingly important to take those um, really thoroughly into account, even if Lambda CDM is the correct model of our universe. Um, okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for this step-by-step uh, uh, -step overview. Um, can you, uh, is there any questions from the audience? Okay, then I have a question actually pertaining uh, to your summary. You say the density field of the universe looks like it converges to statistical homogeneity. I think the, the challenge with a statement like this is that, uh, you know, different people looking at different data sets like the CMB, for instance, as complementary to this, uh, may be looking at the same question at different resolutions, statistical resolution. And so in some sense, a statement like this uh really in order to facilitate these multiple directions in which you address this deep question has, has to be supplemented within the statistical homogeneity given the finite you know uncertainties that we have with this particular approach of looking at at uh, at uh, galaxies um and the reason i'm saying that also is because that is suggestive as to how how do we go uh, further along the same direction? So the LSST, for instance, might be useful or hopefully should be useful for this. So maybe you can comment on this, how much you know, quantitative improvement by what factor uh, might be, uh, we might be looking at in the, when LSST comes uh, online. Yes, I was careless in that summary statement in that it should have said in this one particular data set with um, the definition of homogeneity that we chose. Uh, and so uh, I don't have any quantitative estimates for how much better we'll be able to do with LSST and DESI and things like that, um, unfortunately. But um, I do recognize that, um, yes, I was a bit, a bit careless in that statement. Well, you're talking to an audience who is I mean, not myself, but very well versed in um, precision CMB analysis. <laughs> exactly, yes. Yes, and it was really interesting to see Miguel's talk this morning with um, some of the aberrations that you see in the CMB. That's the same kind of thing that I was talking about with the luminosity distance effects that yeah, yeah. you might see in supernovae that we yeah, often Yeah, like. you're addressing the same uh, 
question. Yeah. Okay, I see three hands up. Uh, Michael, Quartin. Okay, I think I was the last reason, but anyway, it's a nice, very nice talk. And I, I do have a question, which is um, a perspective question, which is I, I have picked up interest recently on using uh, supernovae to as velocity tracers. You know, so um, even uh, Colin Howlett also has a couple of papers on this, on trying you know to measure the velocity spectrum with supernovae because they are very promising in, in this way, and you can reach you know in principle the signal to noise and the velocity part all the way to high redshifts 0 0.3, 0 0.4, even 0.5. So um, how feasible you think this will be in the you know in the near future, and you know, what what do you expect is the main challenges if you try to do velocity tracing with supernovae? Um, I think that it's a really promising tool, as you say. The precision of the distances that you can get with supernovae is so much better than things like fundamental plane and Tully Fisher if you want to map the velocity distribution of the universe. Of course, you're confronted with the sparseness of the sample as the main limitation. Um, things like LSST will find many, many supernovae, whether they're followed up sufficiently and have light curves that are, are of high enough quality to be able to put them uh, to measure distances from them is one of the big challenges with that uh, and getting redshifts and things for them. But I've seen, also seen ideas of looking at the redshifts photometrically. So um, if you're, but if we're doing that, we have to con concern ourselves a little bit with potential biases. So I think it's very promising, but there's, there's, uh, uh, and I think it's a really exciting thing to do. Now, one of the things I, I spun, stumbled upon, and I, I, don't, I don't think we have an answer for is that, you know, you can, of course, you can use Spinova's velocity trace. You can also use them as density trace as well, because then you can have both density and velocity in the same trace. But then you, 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 you end up with questions is, what is the supernova bias? You know, we have, we are not, we're starting to get a hand, a grip on what's galaxy bias, but what is supernova bias? So you think it's gonna, you're gonna able to answer this question? <laughs> uh, I'll leave that for the, the future investigations. I'm not sure, but uh, but yes, that kind of thing does become uh, an issue, yeah. Okay, on of that course, note- we don't care as much about the bias when we're looking at velocities as we do with the densities. That's true. Yeah. On that note, Tamara, you want to take the second question from Eon? Uh, okay, th yeah, th thanks for the talk, Tamara. Um, yeah, the, the, actually, I've been looking at this, uh, these claims of, you know, breakdown in FLRW from inhomogeneities, like large structures. Um, and you go, if you go to Wikipedia, it's the first thing that strikes you, right? You go to the cosmological principle page, and it's all about inconsistencies, like, um, yeah, so, so the result that's quoted there is like Yadav et al. Like, so it's 260 divided by H megaparsec. So it seemed like Wiggle Z was well within that, so pretty safe. So they used N body simulations. I forget which simulation, but yeah, I mean, and they assumed Lambda CDM, right? Um, yeah, it's certainly an interesting topic, right? Uh, but, but this isn't necessarily, that's more a comment. The question I had is, oh, let me start with this. So some people are doing high Z observable. So they're doing quasars and they're doing uh, GRBs. And, and typically they just use the heliocentric redshifts. They don't correct at all. Like, I mean, I can give you an example. I don't want to name names, but there are people who are building, you know, they've got maybe 2,000, 3,000 quasars. They've got um, some way of standardizing them. Um, a very small number of them are below 0.1, like maybe 15 or so. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, I mean, how worried should we be about this? Like, given that the bulk of their sample is at very high Z, right? It's different from supernovae, right? Yeah, I guess um, if you're looking at luminosity distances of any sort, then you do have to be aware that there is going to be a beaming effect as well from our motion that needs to be taken into account. So it's not just, it doesn't just impact the redshift, it also impacts how bright things will appear. Um, and also there are, we do also have to remember that even above redshift one, there are bulk flows expected uh, as well. It's like the the bulk velocity hasn't completely dropped to zero with that, those scales. Um, so those are the two sort of things that I would um, note, I guess. Right, but I, I'm saying the community just, they don't consider this at all. I think they just take their their, their redshifts at face value and, and there's really aren't any maps uh, or what, I mean, a bulk flow at, I, I just take their data at face value, right? So, hmm. yeah, and they don't seem concerned. 
Yeah, well, I, I like the the effect on luminosity distance is very second order, and like it's something that's usually completely neglected, and we don't really don't really care about. Um, and I don't know the answer to whether it could affect these samples or not. It's just the kind of thing that if I see it, if I see um, bog flows in you know, something lining up with our direction of motion, I, I want to make sure that none of these effects are coming into play. Um, and so, yes, I, I can't answer whether there's there's those effects in, in any of those data sets. Okay, can, can I ask you then a, a related question? Where do you believe we enter the CMB frame, right, in terms of redshift, right? Because this is probably something Ramiz is going to ta touch on now, but like, so the number yesterday given, I think, by Roy was essentially 0.3 to 0.5, right? So you, you mean basically, but it seems very like conservative, right? Some people believe it's 0.1, right? Um, I would assume that we had to go a fair bit higher than that to like really truly be at in the CMB rest frame. I think the number I had, depending on your window function and stuff is your, I mean, it's small, but you've got a 13 or 10, 10 ish kilometer per second bulk flow at a redshift of one um, in Lambda CDM. So you haven't even gone to non zero velocity by redshift of one, but it's a small, a small, I think, compared to the, some of the effects that have been observed. So, but it's just something to remain aware of. Okay, Guillaume, further or? Uh, no, I think I'm okay. I will, we'll, we'll continue this later. Yeah, okay. So next, uh, Mohamed, Ramez. Yeah, I had a <coughs> sorry, comment that if a peculiar velocity causes a shift in the Hubble constant of, of seven kilometer per second per megaparsec or so, that's not something to be corrected for to measure the Hubble constant to a lower precision, but it is a lower limit on the physical meaning of the idea of a Hubble constant. Because these peculiar velocities of galaxies don't change in human time scales within linear perturbation theory or from empirical constraints on redshift drift, the, uh, the velocities change by order of one kilometer per second on, on tens or hundreds of thousands of time scales. So, they trace out a shape that is very different from isotropic expansion in the local universe. And consequently, all this claimed precision of Hubble constant being measured to less than 10% is only because you're putting this sort of unphysical assumptions into data. It's like, it's like correcting all your points on the surface of the Earth towards a assumed sea level and then claiming you have measured the radius of the Earth to a precision less than 21 kilometers. It's, uh, it's absurd. So I, and I agree that's that it's what that's people seem quite, to be doing. I think that's a quite apt analogy. The, step, the separation into um, recession velocities and peculiar velocities is really a, a mathematical convenience, um, which allows us to describe some some things. Uh, it's no, but, but it's I, not I, a I mathematical that. convenience. Mathematically, the underlying physics, which everyone agrees on, is GR, is supposed to be coordinate in mirror, right? And mm -hmm. this is a model inconvenience, and the model is a toy model. So, mm -hmm. so much of the, almost everything done with peculiar velocities in cosmology is uh, is absurd because Actually, Ramiz, it, it has Ramiz, no physical meaning. Just to frame this, like I, I'm not even cons like I'm a little worried that the H zero problem is not even well defined. Like it's not even clear yeah, to me yeah. that astronomers can not. determine H zero uniquely it, once they get below a it, certain precision. Hey, it, Tamara, it do you want to comment well on defined. that? It, do, do you think that you yeah, think, uh, so, actually we can open this up? Yeah, yeah, yeah we are I'm, in I'm a discussion that. session now, so uh, you can do formal and informal do, discussion. Do, do, do we have an argument why astronomers believe that they can determine H0 to well, like I, one percent? To, to quickly answer the question about physical meaning from Ramiz um, before, um, the uh, I think the I think. I understand your concerns, but I think calling it absurd is going a step too far. Um, I think there is a physical meaning that in that we see redshifts for things. So this is a difference in the wavelength of light from emission to ab absorption. Regardless of your interpretation of velocities or whatever you do with that, there's an observational dimensionless number that changes there. Um, and so that is a hallmark of something, you know, it's measurable. So the peculiar velocities are meaningful in that, in that sense, Separ separating it into um, recession velocities and peculiar velocities, you can we can argue about that, but I don't think it makes it completely um, meaningless to describe it in that way. Um, and then the other question was the um, oh, can we actually measure H naught? 
um, I guess in that's it comes a bit with that uncertainty principle of the universe thing. Um, I, I want to ask Adam this question. Has he thought about whether it's you can actually uniquely define it? <laughs> I'm sure he hasn't. I think we're, we're far from what, what the point where it becomes impossible at the level of precision that we have at the moment, but in, I'd have to think about it in principle as you go, go higher. Yeah, I, I think the concern I have this is this, that basically if you have, like if you can get to 1%, right, you choose Cepheids with supernovae, right, and then choose your anchors differently, right, build your, your, your distance ladder, right, is it possible that we can get two groups that basically get to 1% error and they disagree on H0? Because we've chosen different anchors. Which effect are you talking about? Just a sample variance that? Uh... Uh, yeah, I mean, this is this is the concern I have, right? Um, so basically, like the the, the result that basically um, Subir likes is this paper by McClure and Dyer from I think two thousand and seven. Ramiz will be familiar with it, and it shows basically it's the aftermath of basically the key project, and it shows the H zero determinations on the sky, and it really looks like a sea of H zero determinations. So you're basically, in some sense, you have to extract the Hubble flow from all of these. And then, of course, once you extract the Hubble flow, then you get your peculiar velocities, right? Um, well, so I'm not, I'm not sure exactly, but if, you, if you're referring to sample variance, the fact that we can be diff sitting in different spots in the universe to measure Hubble constant, and I don't know if that's oh, I'm not, I'm not referring to that. I, I'm basically worried that basically how we're building the, dis the, the distance ladder. If we build, like if we all follow the same track, so take TRGB and Cepheids at the moment, as long as we use the same anchors, then it's just a question of whether or not TRGB agrees with Cepheids. And we don't have to roll I, it into I, 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 No, I think you need to clarify whether you're asking a question of principle in the, concerning the concept of H0 or a, a question on principle in cons, concerning the limitations of measurement, yeah. Uh, well, I'm just saying that basically everything's in motion in the local universe. Local universe is not FLRW. I, I mean, your bottom rung of your distance ladder is extremely difficult, right? But if I can step in in our discussion, I mean... This is, sorry, we're a bit off topic, but... We get exactly... You know, if you talk about modern independent measurements in cosmology, it's a mess, even for distances. You don't have to go to velocities. You know, really, truly modern independent is really tough. Now, you can always, of course, assume a model and make you know, all your measurements, assuming that model and test for consistency checks. And you, you can see if there's, you know, your model doesn't fit the data. And you can do that for distances, you can do that for velocities. I mean, Lambda CDM has very clear predictions of what because of velocities, how they should behave and how they should enter and your distances and your supernova measurements, it's, it's all there. And then if, you know, it, of course, it, it doesn't mean that if you measure, you prove Lambda CDM, there could be other models that also have you know, similar predictions, but. I don't understand this, you know, this pointing out, picking up and saying, well, H naught or Picula velocity, they are especially model dependent. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, everything, the short version is that everything is model dependent. Almost nothing is, you know, so, so yeah, that's right. There's nothing yeah, bad but, about you know, To add on the comment, there is, there is an, there is an extra absurdity in how peculiar velocity corrections are done to supernova because the very model they're using to correct has an external bulk flow right outside the volume. So the data as they're releasing has uh, this the, the supernovae outside that volume uncorrected for, which means that um, within the data is, is encoded the picture of a universe where like a, a shell around us is smashing into the far field universe, which is not uh, you know treated as moving, it is treated as at rest. So there is now also a discontinuity within the data, which however is smaller than the, uh, than the statistical error bars, which are obtained by this adjusting procedure by which they adjust the statistical error bars but till you get a chi-square of one degree of freedom. So Ramiz, this is, this is so a comment it's, it's, about JLA, right? So you're basically complaining that they correct up to a certain redshift. Point, also, also Pantheon. Also and Pantheon, Pantheon, Pantheon as well, JLA and the, Pantheon, okay. Yeah. Yes, and um, these are the largest that, data sets of supernovae. Yeah, I know that the reason that that's in there is because the effect on the measurement of cosmology is negligible because there's as much in front as behind. But nevertheless, the next version of supernova data that's going to come out uh, will have modeled the velocities beyond that um, radius rather than just setting them to zero or setting them to the value of the bulk flow. There's a couple of different things that have been done. 
Um, no, but, but, but if you have peculiar velocities to such large scales, what you should admit is that the universe is anisotropic, and you should also admit that it doesn't have a rest free. No, 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 wait a minute. Ramiz, you can always define a rest frame, right? You can always define a rest frame as the C, like as the CM, you know, at the CMB. I think that's fine, right? You just subtract a dipole, right? What's wrong with this? Um, because there's always at least have, one. If you do that, then all your local data also needs to be corrected to that frame, both for both the observer motion and the motion of that source with respect to that frame. You can always the choose one frame. Is, one frame. So, so, may I interrupt? Yep. Yeah, I would like to. I think, I would I like think to... there's there's something which is I mean it's sort of, sort of kind of a misunderstanding between among people. Uh, you know, when you say a nicer to be or I mean homogeneous, well, some people think about density in homogeneity or maybe velocity. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but they other for other people it's geometry. Okay, you know we know that for example in in the uh, you know. In, in this say local universe or local even is, you know in this solar system we are moving or we, our density homogeneity is huge you know a delta over law of about 10 to 30 but gravity is very weak which means that we don't uh, contribute much to the uh, homogeneity of geometry itself so, so that's that's yeah, not that's true that's gravity, gravity is formulated in gravity. terms of clocks yeah, attached to bits of matter my sentence, can I? <laughs> so when you talk about all this in homogeneous distribution of maybe a peculiar velocities and all these things just make sure these can introduce a huge a geometrical and isotropy or in homogeneity and if not the case this you know flrw assumption as a geometry is a very good approximation. Okay, so so this is something well some theorists should do clarify and I, I'm pretty, yeah I, I know there have been some some works on on this uh, respects but and uh, usually unless you really have a huge uh, say a nicety or density homogeneity on say gigaparsec scale you don't really have to worry about you know, sort of a the geometrical sort of a, you know, a inhomogeneities away from FLRW and local universe, right? Okay, that's, that's it. Can I uh, add a complementary comment to Eon's point, whether H0 can be measured at all? Of course, that's a tantalizing question. But somebody should know, think about it. <laughs> eh? Somebody should think about it, right? I don't think well, I, I just about thought it. about it. I don't and, think I don't think Adam's I, thought about it. <laughs> no, well, but you can uh, you can give a uh, the following comment. Uh, we all agree that it is related to the age of the universe, and that of course is somewhat model dependent. Um, the simplest thing you take age to be constant um, forever. But the point is that. Uh, you can then ask the same question about the age of the universe as we measure it here on Earth or in the solar system. Would you think that that is something that can, in principle, be arbitrarily accurately determined? That's not an unrelated question. So I'll leave you to think about it. You don't need to answer now. You can write a separate paper about it. I, I thought about it. I haven't. I, yeah, the but paper I think, is I sort of in the pipeline. <laughs> no, but I, my point is these questions should be addressed side by side if you want to push this to. Uh, a, 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 a principal a, a principal point of doubt. Yeah, there's no citations in it. <laughs> you know, and maybe it's not unrelated to, to Tamara's uh, earlier slides where she pointed out this uh, idea of a uh, uncertainty principle in uh, uh, in, in measuring these uh, these issues. I, I forgot what slide number five or six or something. Um, so, and that would refer to a measurement, a limitation of measurement, not, not, not a fundamental thing. Well, fundamental in measurement, so yeah. I see David questions. questions. Okay, uh, David Wiltshire has a question. Okay, so, um, well, I've got various answers to all your points, <laughs> but let's not get into that, Morris. I'll, I'll talk about that later. But uh, I've got a question for Tamara, um, in particular, looking at 
various things uh, uh, relating to supernova, the discussion that was just going on. So I, I, I can't use the Pantheon sample because um, it's done too much, there's too much modeling of um, systematic errors put into the, put into the into the data that's released and you can't get the, the, the covariances, et cetera, as you can with the JLA sample. But we found an interesting, and this is not published, an, an interesting and disturbing thing is that 95 supernova, more than 10% of the sample were quietly removed that were in JLA and not, not in Pantheon. And when we have those so in the original Pantheon so survey, um, we see doing a particular analysis in which we don't assume um, anything about peculiar velocities, which I'd call peculiar expansions, but um, in that we see what we'd say is a definite signature of a scale of statistical homogeneity if you keep on cutting out data below a certain redshift and, and then redo the analysis because you have to put in a model um, together with all the other things. So this is extending work that I did with uh, Lawrence Dam and, and Asta Heinesen. And if we repeat that on the, just, we can't use Pantheon, it's impossible. But if we take out the 95 supernova, which are at many different redshifts, and I won't be discussing this in my, I, I, it's not, not something I'm discussing in my talk, but then um, the results change very significantly. And no one say, says why they've quietly removed 95, 95 good supernova out of the sample, but um, it looks, you know, um, I have no idea. Do you, do you know? Uh, uh, David, can I interrupt and maybe uh, rephrase your question in one sentence? Uh, <laughs> why have 95 supernova been quietly yeah. removed from what was, so, so Pantheon said, we've got this great new sample of 1,000 supernova, but they've yeah, removed... Yeah, 1,082 or something like that. Yeah, They've removed 95 that were in the JLA, which were the gold standard, so, have been removed. Why? Okay. I, I wasn't involved in that analysis, so I can't answer for certain. I can only say that as we get better data, we can be more demanding in the cuts that are made. So that you, it used to make it, the number of points before and after peak on a supernova light curve um, can, uh, you need a certain number in order to be able to get the light curve precisely. There's certain cuts on the color and stretch and thing that we need in order to make it a normal supernova. Uh, and the, um, and as you, every time we rerun analysis, an analysis with a slight change in systematics or something, some supernovae will pass some cuts. And then in, if we change a systematic or something, some of those supernovae will no longer pass those cuts. And so though I, I would expect that those have just not passed a cut that was made more stringent now that we have better data and don't need to include, right. or, and but, we're sort of getting more picky. Yeah, but a problem is that the model, the model, the cosmological model is going into those cuts. And, and if you see results which change <laughs> your cosmological interpretation, if you're not, so the, the problem is if you're not using the FLRW model, you can't actually test the FLRW model when it's being put into the data analysis. And this is really you know, I'd, I'd really like to just see the raw data as it was for JLA and that, you know, no, they don't give it. And then people, you, you, you hear all these conclusions that people draw, you know, so we, we had that dark energy talk just before, you know, um, but there, there's a lot of model going in, in, in there already in those cuts. I'll, um, I'll ask exactly what you mean by the, the raw data and make sure that it comes out in the next sample that I am involved with the, the dark energy survey and stuff like that. Right. Um, I just want to note that um, that uh, Mohammed said in the, the comments that supernova data are outright fraud. I think that's, uh, that's very unprofessional to say this and to think that of your colleagues. I do not think that any of the colleagues here are attempting to um, instigate fraud. And I think that's ex exceptionally rude and inappropriate. Yeah, I, I think yeah, that I have to I, agree I, with I, that. Yeah, so, I, sorry, Ramiz, I, I, I agree with I, that. No, no, Ramiz. Assumptions. Yeah. Sure, sure, it can be fraud. 
<laughs> it can't be fraud. Because no one says we removed 95 supernova because <laughs> you know, they, they didn't survive cutting. There's just... This is astrophysics. Come on, it's not fraud. <laughs> there's those yeah, also, in I mean, also the model that you're doing out of these corrections with is like 95% dark. And so, you know, the standards of fraud are lower, I would say. Wow, well, I, mean, I, 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 I think we should just to remain uh, optimistic and, and constructive, just stick yeah. to, you know, at a minimum of scientific, uh, let's say, uh, protocol. Uh, yeah. We certainly are able to take your comments in stride. There is no, no lack of our flexibility on that part. But, um, you know, it, it, it technically... Yeah, but all it, of this was pointed out by George. No, my, my point is, no, 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 wait, wait. Technically, it, it doesn't get us to to any progress if, if you know if words like that are being used that's all right um, so, so but no, wait, uh, like for instance uh, you there's don't... another question by by dragon and i would like to mm. give dragon the floor and then of course we can come back i mean i i kind of enjoy this discussion it's quite open so that's perfect but dragon please go ahead yeah, I wanted to shift back to the dipole, but maybe before that, let me just address David. David wants the raw data. David, I'm not sure you want to see the raw data. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I would it's, just like to see things. You know, well, and you know, the part of the things for which they clean, as Tamara said, are, you know, number of light curves before, number of data points in the light curve before and right. after the peak. Okay. Whether so, it's a type so, two so supernova, yeah. uh, let me, allow me to finish. If it's a type two yeah. supernova, then that doesn't belong there. It's completely independent of the cosmological model. You know, take it out of the sample. So it's things of that sort. I don't know what they've done in that exact analysis, but that's the type of thing they they typically do. So it's not it's not like you know somebody scuttled away with something that didn't fall on the on the theory curve. Yeah, but so so but a problem. If you look at the actual, I mean, I've looked at it in some detail all the the modeling that they do because they include they're including. It, simulate in body simulations and things like this and trying to work out systematic uncertainties which is fine if, if it is the lambda cdm model i've got no problem with that it's just that when you if yeah. you want to i mean i, I think need... i think what you're pointing to is uh, that there should be a more automated procedure for doing this rather than nursing them one by one and and you know and i think as it's exactly as tamara said this is coming up in, in upcoming surveys it's still relatively early days in how this is done uh, you know there is yeah, no, no automated J procedure well J jla was was given in a way with big covariance matrix so you could go and, and do a lot of things with it um without yeah. you know yeah um uh, and m maybe i want to just shift this discussion back into uh, the first talk and uh more information about the dipole than, than i think i've heard in my life all at once but I used to be happy because I thought I understood the dipole, but now I realize I don't because Miguel had three kinds of dipole. He had a, at least three kinds of measurements. He had aberration, a Doppler, and something called boosted, and, and that got me confused. But uh, for my specific question, Miguel, um, at least um, the differences seem to come from the fact that part of it is um, intrinsic. So if you assume that part of it is intrinsic, then you get these different uh, measures of dipole. But I thought in adiabatic fluctuations, intrinsic dipole is like a gauge thing. You can you can select a coordinate system and make it zero. So I, I think I'm confused on this point. So do, can you maybe clarify that? Right. So thanks for the question. So let's first clarify. There's not three dipoles. It's just the one dipole, right? The CMB dipole is there, just one. Now the point is, you know, the dipole you can is a vector. Right, so the, if uh, you can look for cross checks, you know, if you have this vector and it's kinematic, then it will induce correlations, and these correlations you can decompose them into components and create a vector of them. So you can then create three three vectors, which is the dipole vector, which is the CMB you know temperature measurements, and then you can create two other vectors. One is the aberration direction. So which direction the sky you have aberration of light. So if, if you have aberration of light is a dipole aberration of light. Sorry, if you have a dipolar pattern, which is exactly the same as a dipolar lensing effect, okay, in this sense, and then you can create, you know, it's a dipole, you can create a vector and, and measure this vector. That's what I meant by the aberration dipole, if you want. And you also have, a, uh, this is, now the third one is more technical, but because of the frequency shift, you do get also a coupling, which is L plus one, and that is just like a, a cross term between some dipole and the temperature fluctuations. And this, some dipole you can measure, and this 
is basically a term in a, it's a, it's a cross term you're measuring what's the dipole which is a multiplicative term so you can define this and if if everything is kinematic they all should be in agreement point in the same direction up to you know uh, instrumental noise or cosmic device they should all point in the same direction have same amplitude etc so these are the measurements we are trying to to make okay but you cannot see you cannot say that you saw more dipoles than you thought about. You have a whole paper in dipoles in the sky, which has you know, more dipoles than I can this now. Anyway, now the second part of the question is uh, right. So if you have adiabatic uh, perturbations, there is you right uh, a large amount of gauge degeneracy there, right? So uh, it's hard to you know if you if you think about everything in Poisson gauge, then you can talk about an intrinsic temperature fluctuation and an intrinsic gravitational potential uh, so you have tau which is temperature intrinsic fluctuations then you have phi whatever is the intrinsic bipolar gravitational potential and then if you work out all the uh, all the the perturbation equation you can see you know okay so is it completely true that you know you get the same exactly you know it's completely degenerate and the, uh, the answer is uh, with the, is no that you, you you do not get aberration in this case you do not get you know you, you get the dipole it's fine but you don't get aberration so it's not true that is i don't i don't think so i think douglas is scott is here he has some i think he talked about this before but i don't think it's completely degenerate right it is a gen oh, which, which just, thing is the gen what do you mean by degenerate i mean let's rephrase it so he means intrinsic if there's an intrinsic dipole you still get many of these effects that ah oh, okay 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 that uh, Miguel talked about okay so the question is can you ever tell whether there's an intrinsic dipole my my suspicion is that you can't but I haven't managed to prove that yet so my suspicion is that you can because you know if you yeah, if you do so have that's, something that's, just... that's cool no I would I so we're you know there's a thing to find out because we don't know I I I mean I agree that we don't know. Right. So anyway, I'm not a, I'm not actually an expert on perturbation theory. You have to work up second order perturbation theory, so I know a bit and I have this paper out. But the point is, I think the end of the day is is it only a gauge quantity? And I think it, it, it can be, but then you have to make assumptions on what is the inflation model you work in. So I think okay, if you are so working my, single fuel, the thing that I've always wondered. And I just, I don't feel like I'm smart enough to work it out. So I keep asking younger people who I hope are smarter than me and they haven't done it either. The, as you say, aberration is different, but aberration is the same as L equals one lensing. So if you have a giant perturbation lensing the sky, it would look exactly the same as aberration. So let's imagine that the dipole is the intrinsic dipole is caused by an Isaac curvature perturbation. And the same Isaac curvature perturbation makes L equals one lensing that looks like aberration. If that was true, then I think you could never tell. <laughs> so, so that's the so, thing that I would love somebody to either prove or disprove and it hasn't happened so, yet. Okay, so I, I did think about this for a while, Douglas, and I, I think my, the answer is, if you have uh, intrinsic dipole, okay. So sorry, if you have intrinsic dipolar lensing, if you, sorry, if you have dipolar lensing, so if you have a dipolar lensing effect, as you said, it looks just like aberration. Mathematically, it's the same. Now, if you have dipolar lensing, you need to have the lens. You need to have structure there in the line of sight, which is your lens. So in principle, I think it's nothing impeding you from doing large scale structure surveys and looking if whether the, there is such a lens. I mean, if the matter distribution universe has a dipole in it in the intermediate ratio so that it produces the lensing you know kernel necessary and to get the same effect so i in first if you want to, to just be you know first principles yes you can have regeneracy you can have aberration like them just with lensing but i think in, in reality you really have to fine tune a lot your your model to, to do that because then you have to fine tune it so you have a huge lensing maybe you know very far away from all the galaxies that you cannot see it etc so uh, yeah, so that's I, why I just yeah I just have this this inkling that maybe right it is it is exactly the lensing that you get from the Isaac curvature perturbation that makes an L equals one intrinsic dipole and if that's true then then you can never tell and I I have no idea whether that's true and I sat down to try to do the calculation and it's too hard for me <laughs> I, 
I'm happy so to we, confess. We do, have a paper, we do have a paper from four, four years ago or so, which is my former student, uh, Roldan, is the first author. And the point we find in the end to summarize is that you can, in principle, do this, you know, have the same effect without velocity, but you do have to fine tune your potential. It's just like it's a similar fine tuning that you know the, these the previous LTB models without dark energy you live in a cosmic giant void that you have to be right in the center. You have to put a potential which is a square potential. You have to be right in the middle of the sort of parabolic potential. You have to be right in the middle. And if it's nice curvature, you also have to fine tune the the less scattering surface. I mean, if you can do it today, but in one billion or few billions of years, uh, the you know the the cosmologists wouldn't think it's the same. So you, you really have to fine tune the cosmic time. So that is my point. So I don't know, Dragan, for you, if you answer your question or not. Yeah, thank you. No, no, it's clear about, so, and Misa Sasaki, who is an expert on perturbation theory, says in the chat that indeed there can be an intrinsic yeah, dipole yeah. that's not and gauge. I'm, that's quite interesting. I'm not arguing with Misao about perturbation theory. <laughs> so. We should have yeah. I should have put some money in the bed before yeah. Misao wrote his message. <laughs> so but, yeah, yeah, I understand. Uh, anyway, uh, thank you for your answer. Yeah, much clearer now. Thank you. Right. Actually, just to follow up on that, like suppose we do find. I mean, it's if we do um, find an intrinsic dipole, right? I mean, this is going to take a long time, obviously, right? Then, then this would depends. depends. It could be very large, and it could be to you know, next experiments. If it is really depends on how much it is, right? Like maybe the if next. If it's at minus five, then it's going to be a long time. Yeah. Okay, but if, even if we don't, even if we show it's just purely kinematic, then we still seem to have some sort of mismatch between like the CMB dipole and what Suber is seeing, or what Dominic's seeing, right? So it's like some sort of early universe, late universe mismatch in the dipole, which you could then sort of say, okay, H zero tension is the same thing. Cosmic shear is the same thing. There seems to be something weird going on between CMB, like the Planck Lambda CDM universe as defined by CMB, and then what we're seeing in, in, in the late universe. So you, I, think, I agree with you in the sense, let's take the radio uh, galaxy dipole, right? Those no, over a thousand kilometers per second. We're not solving that. Measuring or not measuring the intrinsic CMB dipole is not going to solve that. I mean, what happens is that the intrinsic semi dipole maybe tells you something, you know, if you measure something which is very large and expected in lambda CDM, then maybe it gives you some hint on what's happening in those large scale anomalies or the quadrupole, maybe, right? You measure something which is very large and expectedly large, and maybe you have a different model. And then you can work out what is the radio dipole. But in principle, as first principle, no, it's a, the, this thousand kilos per second should not be there as far as I understand. Right. But you, so yeah, exactly. That's a good point. So your constraints already are pointing to a problem, right? Right. I mean, there, there, there is this toy explanation that no one, no one ever made, but we ruled out anyway, which is, you know, is that, you know, this thousand kilometers per second could be that you have a very large velocity and, and a very large intrinsic semi-dipole partially canceling out. And this bugged me in my mind for some time, you know? So what I'm saying is you measure 370 kilometers per second, but it could be that you have a thousand kilometers per second velocity and a 630 negative intrinsic dipole, okay? And you have the net. So, I mean, it's, it's fine tuning, but I don't, I don't care. So this could have been true, but now I think this is ruled out. So this could have been an explanation for the galaxy. So you have a huge velocity, but there's something also, you know, two, two large things which are canceling out and now no longer, right? And this will improve with future CMB experiments, you know, less, rule, less room for this kind of uh, fine tuning. So, so at face value, we seem to have a mismatch early universe, late universe in the C in the cosmic dipole. That's yeah, how it's working. I, I don't know. I, I think I think is uh, yeah. I think the galaxy dipole is you have to be sorted out independently. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Either I would like to it's not the or some systematic. I would like to turn to Jenny Wagner, who is raising her hand. Yes, I have a more general question about the methodology. Because when I see that we are we want to go to precision cosmology, we need to be sure what method we are using. And for instance, uh, for supernovae data, we have the light curve fitter and we have the fit to the cosmological model. And then it's the question, do we first fit the light curve and afterwards fit the cosmology? Or do we marginalize over all nuisance parameter that we have and then fit the cosmology? Or do we do a joint fit, like uh, simultaneously fitting for the nuisance parameters and the cosmology? 
And I think depending on which, which method you choose, you will get different error bounds and you will get slightly different results. So what would you say is the best method in order to get our cosmological parameters in the yeah, most reasonable physical way? Mara? Sorry, I was distracted by a comment in the chat briefly at the beginning of that um, discussion, but you're asking whether we should fit things simultaneously or not. Um, yes, basically. Uh, yeah, the, the, there are some things we should do. Uh, sorry, I'm still distracted by the, the comment in the, in the chat. Um, yeah, me I'll just too. Make... So I, I, I only have one brain. That's a bit uh, difficult, but I think yeah. uh, we should give a preference to Jenny's uh, question. I can, yes. I can come in briefly. Well, thanks. If you, yeah, uh, we, uh, well, Jenny. So we have to fit simultaneously, and then marginalize. So it's one and the same operation. Fit simultaneously with nuisance parameters and marginalize over the ones. We don't particularly care about the leap constraints on the ones we do. Um, we are currently marginalizing over a lot of parameters. A dark energy survey analysis is marginalizing over about 20 nuisance parameters out of 26 or so to leave constraints on the other six. And there's no way around it. Uh, I heard them using a comment by George of Statue in one conference saying, you should never have more than five nuisance parameters by, you know, by decree, which uh, I sympathize with that, that state, but that's not the reality, you know, we just have things we don't know. And um, there's no going back. I think we have to marginalize over all these nuisance parameters, as Planck did already in their analysis. So just following up on that, Dragon, you could complain about Pantheon then, right? Because they've done, you know, they've cleaned everything up uh, and then they fit the cosmological parameters, right? Uh, yeah, that's a bit different. I, I don't know how much they cleaned. I don't know what they've done. Ideally, you don't want to do you know what they've done ideally we don't want to do in the future we want to do it better not clean anything beforehand and then do analysis but in one go have nuisance parameters and all the data and have things settle out mm -hmm. well it will be interesting to see if you get then different results or the same results so in some sense one can one can argue you should you should try to do both we have sort of similar issues in analyzing gravitational wave data you know, how much do you want to pre-select the data based on whatever indicators and, and flags of different colors you might imagine, and then do your analysis, or which I kind of personally prefer, just take the data blindly as is so that you completely avoid any uh, cherry picking and let the algorithm, you know, do its job. And then of course, a posteriori, you can, you can go back and, and see if there was any need for uh, down selecting before the analysis. I think this is kind of similar. Yeah, in some sense, but I think I'm more like when we have a nonlinear goal function, then it might be different to first fix some parameters and then optimize for others instead of jointly optimizing all parameters together. So you may end up in, a, in another optimum. That's what I'm bothering about. Oh, I see. Well, that's a very, I, I don't think it's an issue to be bothered. It's just something you should state very explicitly. I mean, numerically, we would call this a continuation method and it's perfectly fine to get an answer. Then your question is, is that the answer I should give most trust? Mm -hmm. and, and that, of course, it's up to the person to analyze it, to then explore alternatives to show the robustness. So it's, it's a proper question, but it's, 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 it's intrinsic to the challenge to develop good techniques. I mean, it's not, I don't think it's an issue to be dogmatic about other than the, wh whatever you choose, you should demonstrate some level of robustness, right? Yes, in principle, I think the community has to just fix what they want. I mean, which optimum are you aiming for? Well, I, I think it's very hard to get any consensus in this community, <laughs> which, is, which is fine because it kind of stimulates, you know, uh, exploring different angles. I think the answer is you just want to be very, very transparent in what you do. I think Dragon yeah. gave the answer though, right? We should basically marginalize over everything in one. Well, and if I, if I can add just a comment on this, uh, you know, Jenny, it's not like, you have some choices. I mean, so Dark DES has a huge validation analysis. I think something like 50 people spend something like a few years doing this, you know? So this is a, a spread mm -hmm. over several papers, but 
take for example galaxy bias you just don't know galaxy bias unless if god comes and whispers in your ear what galaxy bias of your galaxies is you you don't know it theory <laughs> for it isn't nearly good enough so you have to marginalize over it mm -hmm. you don't have a choice and mm -hmm. so that makes things simple for you you know you just have to do it Yeah. yeah, yeah, but Jenny, Jenny is emphasizing about the problem with nonlinearities, right? Yes, but but if you if you marginalize over a lot of parameters and you get rid of them, then I think yeah, you you have a you can test for both ways. You can say okay, on the one hand, I'm optimizing for some and leave the others free, or, or set the others by some something else. I think this is possible if we have a very small amount of parameters to test both ways and then see how the result changes. And this is also a kind of like statement for robustness. If we can show that both optima are like close together, or if we can see that how the optimas change, fixing some parameters and then um, optimizing for others, then we can probe the range of degeneracies there. Yeah, I totally agree. That's all a good thing to do. It may be yeah. even mandatory thing to do in analysis to to stress test the model by yeah. seeing yeah. how much fixing of priors. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, of course, over some things you have to marginalize, but what about uh, omega m or omega lambda? Do you want to optimize for them as well when you're fitting H naught? Or what, what, do we, what do you want to do with them, for instance? I think in that case, a simultaneous fit actually does make sense. Um, you don't need to separate it. And even though it's using the the sort of expansion with Q naught and J naught for a, a an expansion history um, makes it model independent. It really isn't because Q and J are chosen to match parameters that match the expansion history of Lambda CDM. So you might as well just use the best fit Lambda CDM model or fit for Omega M and um, Lambda, et cetera, simultaneously. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, or redetermine them if you have a different model. Yeah, exactly, for whatever. In, in, um, in fact, I do find it sometimes sometimes frustrating to to disentangle whether people ex implicitly ha have been using hidden intentionally or unintentionally lambda CDM in some of those parameters or not, and and that I found somewhat annoying. That you know, if it's based on lambda CDM, that's fine. I don't care. I mean, I'm not a proponent, but at least state it very unambiguously. And that that point I find not all this disclosure I I find sometimes obscured. Yes. So I'm I'm you know anyway. Yeah, yeah but, but on the defense of people working data, I mean data as as we have more and more data and more and more you know nuisance parameters to handle, and more systematics to handle. It's sometimes just too much to, to try to do everything in a more independent way. So it it ends up being you know. We have to resort to lambda CDM more and more. When, no, no, as know, I said, that's fine. It's not really increasing size. I think. Yeah. yeah no, 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 like, no. I, no, I think whatever you do, I mean, you, you explore. That's that's the job that we have. But at least you know, make it explicit, so I don't have to scratch my head and do you know another search through the through the PDF whether or not there is this uh, assumption of lambda CDM underneath or not. And I, you know, I can give numerous instances. It's it's sort of persistent. It's not getting any better or worse. Uh, it, but it, it, it's a, it's a it's wasting my time. And usually the answer is yes. There is a lambda CDM assumption behind it. You can call it laziness at some point, by the way. But that's another discussion. Also, confirmation bias as well worries, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, in even if you words, don't assume it, I mean, people they check their results yeah. against lambda blank lambda CDM, right? Yeah, yeah. I completely agree. Thanks for the elaborate answer. <laughs> David, right? Is David, David, do you have still a question? His hand disappeared. Are you saying this confirmation bias in values of H naught currently? Uh, me? Um, no, but I would because worry about. Surely it's the current situation is surely exactly the opposite. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's, that's it's true. It's called Hubble tension, right? So right, but but I still think like so. For example, take uh, strong lensing, right? Strong lensing where we've got this, you know, mass sheet degeneracy, right? So the, the the strong lensing people have two results, right? One that fits Reese and one that fits uh, Planck, right? Uh, they, they've sort of neuter neutralized themselves, right? 
Well, it's not. It's, it's not <laughs> that simple. No, no, it's not. But he, he, oversimplify I, the situation. Yeah, it's it's it's. I, uh, they're they've one foot in each camp, right? It's. Well, do they? Is that true? It it, it is true, right? If you relax uh, the earlier assumptions, you go from seventy three down to sixty seven. Um. Right, but but I think it's a slight worry I have, right? I didn't think the range was so broad, but I thought it was tilted towards one. But right. yeah, David, you have a question, do you? And with up and down. Yeah, I, I don't worry about confirmation bias as much as some people do, because because I know that most groups would love to prove the other group wrong. That's a much stronger yeah. desire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, Planck I did not muted. want to confirm WMAP. Planck would love to have shown that WMAP got the cosmology completely wrong. That was, that was, the, that was a strong desire. And sadly, right, Planck didn't really find anything dramatically different. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so I think there's a strong desire to, to show that, that you've made a dramatic breakthrough by finding a somewhat different result than everybody else. So I, I don't think confirmation bias is driving things currently. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I agree. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I did have my hand up earlier and I, I was muted and I didn't realize why I couldn't get my question out. <laughs> um, okay, so, so uh, Miguel, um, all right. Um, so you, you've been talking about differentiating intrinsic dipole from other things and okay uh, we, we we're working on something which is uh similar but different looking at lambda zekeris models in on very very small scales order one um effect nearby right and uh so I'm very interested in anything about the kinematic interpretation and in particular um so you had uh so so this difference in the directions and then the the question uh, my my particular question is how much are your improvements so you in the modulation of the frequencies etc just dependent on the magnitude of um beta as opposed to direction because it so happens that the local the, the sun is moving with respect to the local group at 320 kilometers per second in not exactly the opposite direction but um, in in a, in, a, in in enough of a different direction that the motion of the local group according to the standard kinematic interpretation is 630 kilometers per second so there are certain things which just depend on beta squared, which I see coming into various equations of, I mean, I've looked a bit at your papers. Um, so what, to what extent do say frequency dependent shifts just depend on the magnitude as opposed to the direction? And uh, because there's uh, clearly there are differences in direction if you include different multipoles. So, so yes, so thanks for the question. So the but it's a vector really modulation right so you can think about cartesian components you have a modulation in x y and z direction that's why you can make an estimator for all three quantities so it does not really depend on the magnitude it depends on the particular three cartesian components of your effect right um so it, it, there's no beta squared or terms which would depend on square terms or the magnitude. The beta square enters, for instance, the Doppler quadruple. There is really beta square, or the effect of. Yeah, of yeah. That, that's, that, those are the sort of things I'm I'm, I'm asking about. All right, but for the modulation, yeah, I know. But uh, I'm just saying. So beta square enters there and enters the power spectrum. The difference between the power spectrum, like the bias, because of this. So for the aberration and the Doppler. Couplings, they do not depend on the amplitude itself, it depends really on the components, right? If you want to do bounds on, on, on just once, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's what you're asking, but just as you, since you mentioned, if you want to do bounds on the amplitude, and I think it's, it's a bit related with what Tamara was showing, if you, if there's, some, there's a bias on the amplitude because the amplitude is a square root of sum of squares, right? 
So if you do measure all components precisely, you still get a bias on the amplitude. So you have to just worry about this a bit. So if you if you quote amplitude values, but for us, no, the amplitude does not enter in our estimations, just in the end, if you want to quote a value. It's just simpler to quote a, an amplitude because people can relate and they can say, well, uh, the intrinsic uh, CMB dipole has to be less than 3.6 uh, millikelvin, but uh, we have results in all components. It's just, uh, you know, since we had a letter, it's just uh, in a web page, but there. By frequency dependence, does it mean that it, when you measure the dipole from different frequency maps, I mean, clean frequency maps, whether the amplitude depends on that or not? Uh, is that the question? Yeah, yeah, you're asking David if he's uh, I mean, yeah, whoever asked the question, I, I, I sorry, late, so I, did not. I, I can't, I, I can't hear you. I have to put the volume up. Ah, I mean, I'm asking whether the, whether the question is about how much is the beta dependent on the frequency map from which it is extracted, or is it the question because there is also a frequency dependent factor in the um, aberration effect that it has on a given map? At different frequencies. Um, yeah, I. Yeah, sorry, I, I don't. I, 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 I can't quite follow your. I can uh, answer something. So the frequency dependent part only affects what I call the Doppler modulations, which are, you know did not affect the variation at all. The variation does not have right. any dependence on frequency. It's uh, independent of frequency. If you want to measure this, what I call the Doppler modulations which are not the change of the angles of the photons, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cross term because of the change of frequencies, then they do depend. I mean, this, the, what I call it, the, pole, the pole, dipole distortions, which are spurious effect, which are not, do not bring any new information. These ones do depend on frequency. So when you want to extract that out of the maps, like we did, because you don't want to see this, you know, we know the dipole already. We don't want you know, another measure of it. It's so, so well measured. So then you have to remove it and then you have to estimate how it is because each frequency contributes a different factor. I don't know if I answer your question. Yeah, I would like to interrupt briefly. Uh, according to the program, now it's 1130. And uh, so this is formally the end of the discussion. Uh, of course, you're welcome to continue. Let me first and foremost thank the speakers of this morning, uh, Michael Quartin, Xiao Jing Wang, and Tamara Davis um, for their uh, excellent contributions. And also, Michael uh, was eager to show to make a, a, a pitch for a upcoming uh, meeting. So my suggestion was to take time of this discussion session if you like to show your uh, poster one more time. Um, and beyond that, um, well, feel free to uh, continue the discussion. But formally, uh, this ends the uh, morning session. I think we could kind of wrap it up, Maurice. I think it's it's okay. We have a look at the poster. So you want to speak your pitch for this poster? Uh... Me too. Oh, you have muted, huh? I don't hear a sound from uh... Miguel. You want to sell the the. Sorry, yeah, yes. what's your uh, sales pitch? Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, just uh, yes, there's a conference, it's called the Cosmos Series Conference, the 2022 uh, edition, going to be in Rio in August, hopefully in person. You know, the pandemic now should allow. And so, it'll be lots of discussion on cosmology and you know, modified gravity and astrophysics. I hope to see some of you there. Save the date. I'm going to, the announcement, the, the formal announcements are going to be soon, but save the date. That's it. OK, thanks very much. And okay, everybody I mean, enjoy the rest of the meeting. Later today, it starts again at uh, 16 hours. Yeah, OK. Thanks, Maurice. Okay. Thank you, thanks. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all.